everyone, and welcome to the 54th episode of Slime Time SideQuest, an official Dragon's Den podcast. This is your host, Platinum 3 And this is your other host, Yangus the Legendary Bandit. Hello, everybody. Ah, we've almost reached the new year now. I feel like I hear Auld Lang Syne, like, everywhere I go. Like the litter box? What now? Look, I know we never really discuss those bizarre songs you you record scratch into the open or you record scratch into the openings for our shows. But look, man, that was that was quite a unique one. You know, I always thought there's really just one thing that I need to get into the show, and that was expanding our horizons into singing animals. So I figured it was either me or never. Ugh, the pun ugh, that pun was a catastrophe. Oh please. If you just wait a meow moment, they'll even get worse. These are getting simply appalling. Oh, Yangus, you know I'm just kidding around. Okay, okay, we can start the show. Okay, all right, good. All right, so tonight we're back with the second half of our annual favorite games played this year episode. Uh, Platy and I will be giving our top games tonight along with some of our guests. Uh, please welcome Pendy, Paul, a.k.a. East X Twitch, and Matt Craft. Ooh, I'm positively excited to have you three gentlemen with us tonight. How has your holidays been? So fur, so good. Good, good. Can't wait to talk games tonight. I've got my thinking cat on. Wait, wait, wait. Games, animals, holidays? What are we even talking about? I can't keep up. You know me. I'm just a real caterbrain. Uh, I love the catitude you guys are all bringing tonight, gentlemen. Okay, uh, enough, enough, enough. Let's just cut to the chase. Oh, damn cat puns. All right, okay, so tonight we got our guests talking about a multiple two multiple two games. Platty and I got our games to talk about. So who are we going to start with, uh, Mr. Platty? We are going to start with Matt Craft. I know he's got some other stuff he's got to do tonight, but he's blessing us with his preference presence live and in person. We don't have virtual Matt Craft. We've got live in person Matt Craft. Hello, Matt Craft. Hello. Well, tonight I'm going to talk about a game that I have replayed at least once every I mean, once the last couple of years now. Infernax, which is a rather, and I do mean rather lovely, 2D dark fantasy Metroidvania. Developed by Berserk Studio and published by the Arcade Crew. It is... The best way that I can describe it is a combination in between a traditional metroidvania mixed in with a little bit of contra a little bit of wizards and warriors from back in the day all wrapped up into a lovely pixely shell the original release was a literal flash game back in the day and then it got re-released in 2022 as a I mean, as a side scroller you control the young Duke Alcador going against a traditional Castlevania backdrop of demons, 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 more demons, and, a, and, and more demons. The blood and gore in the game is quite prevalent, but you can easily look past it with the actual gameplay experience. Returning from the cru Crusades to the land of Upel, you control our young hero as he goes throughout the game, beats the crap out of all the demons, and saves the day eventually. Or do you? One of the unique features of Infernax is a karma system. Whereas in other modern games, you can be both good and evil. And it really actually impacts the game pretty hard. Being evil gets you different weapon types, different magic, Whereas being good does the exact same thing. It has awesome cutscenes, really good gameplay. And just this year alone, it released a brand new update called Do Deuce or Die, D E U X. I can't pronounce it that well. It introduces couch co op and gives you a young squire named Serval who follows you around the entire game if you leave him on AI doing various little extra attacks and magic that helps you out. One thing that I really, really liked about the game, and some people will say boo, is the cheat system. It literally has a built-in, old-school, NES-style Game Genie, 
where you find cheats throughout the game, just like in Banjo Kazooie and its sequels, and you pop it in there. It lets you do some things, such as unlocking a chainsaw to a jetpack, a motorcycle, and some other stuff that they eventually just popped in accessibility options. One of the things about the game that most people do not know is that the creators of the game really loved a lot of the NES style thingus, if you want to call it that. And if you put in the Konami code, you actually it actually turns the game into Contra. Your character gets the giant machine gun and well, you run throughout an entire dark fantasy world with an M60 machine gun blowing away everything in, that moves. So it turns it into a Contravania? Uh-huh. And one of the things, and this is a spoiler, so I apologize for anyone who has not played it, but if you actually 100% the game's Necronomicon slash Demon Compendium, the game actually lets you have it gives you a kind of a post game but it's an alternative final chapter that literally turns the game into contra you spend maybe a couple hours going through a few stages at the end of it and it's a literal running gun one of the things that i also liked about the game in general and you'll be and you will be able to play these little modes depending on what depending on what paths you take but like binding of isaac it changes gameplay types at the very end of the game depending on what you do for example and once again spoilers at the end of the ultimate evil path just like in what just like in binding of isaac at the very end it turns it into a top-down shooter like what do you call it I'm going to, most people don't know what it is, but it's the only thing I can think of. Parodius, R-Type. Yes, yeah, Shmup. Right, Shmup, yep. And that's pretty much it as far as that goes. You can buy, you can buy Infernax on every single console right now. Xbox, Nintendo Switch, PC, P- PlayStation. And with the Deuce or Die update, which is automatic when you buy it new, you get free couch co-op. And for you Evil Dead lovers, the, the for their Halloween update for 2023, they added our lovely hero from the Evil Dead franchise, although obviously masked for copyright reasons. You Ruby. get to play as Ash Williams with his boomstick and his ch- and his beat 'em up stick. You give him the chainsaw from the cheats, and it just rolls through perfectly. Hail to the king, baby! Nice. All right, so that was your uh, number one game of the year, there, huh? Actually, yeah. I've played. Nice. I've actually played more games in 2023 than I have in 2022, and Infernax. Playing back through it with the Deuce or Die update just made it go pop to the top. Kicked Kirby right off. I mean, kicked Kirby right off into the lava of Arizon Citadel. <laughs> Can I say a little about it? Yeah, go right ahead. Mm-hmm. Time. Okay. Yeah, this is Paul, and uh, I also greatly enjoy Infernax. I was going to say about the karma system. You know, it has the good and bad karma, and the decisions you make affect your karma, right? I would mm-hmm. describe it as an imperfect karma system because you can't really tell whether something is going to register as good and bad until after you've done it. Um, for instance, like you might spare somebody, but then he ends up going and killing an innocent person. So it ends up being bad karma, even though you might have thought it was good karma, right? So the only thing that I don't like about it is that you can't tell. Like, I wish it would just tell you flat out good or bad. And I see why they, you know, it's like you can't really know in real life when you're doing things if it's good or bad. But it does make it frustrating if you're trying to do a a perfect good or bad playthrough. You have to follow a guide, basically. You can't just figure your way into it because it's not going to work out. So that's my little criticism. I know that Fair reference enough. that you're talking about. They put that in there, and I that's one of the few things I consider about it that I would call a dick move. <laughs> but yeah, it is a really rich, robust game, like you said, and they added some really cool stuff with free updates, like the extra modes and stuff. So I'm right there with you. That's an excellent game of the year choice. All right. Well, Unfortunately, D- didn't Dave the Diver win uh, game of the year for that? I mean, it was good, but... Mm. 
And that's they're a game very... I heard lots of good stuff about. Oh yeah, it's it's wonderful. If I had played it recently, I would probably want to talk about it, but it's been like several months, like six months or whatever. So Dave the Diver's on sale now. No one for an exhale at this moment, but that game made quite a splash. Yes, it did. <laughs> well, hopefully it does end up sinking in the long run. Oh, there we go. Continue the pun. All right. Well, Matt Craft, thanks for joining us tonight. You have a uh, good rest of the, your holiday season. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you all, too. I am going to go meows along and take me a cat nap. <laughs> all right. Thanks for stopping by with us tonight, Matt Craft. Thank you for having soon. me, as always. All right. I was going to go with Pendy or Paul next. Pendy, you got three games. Paul, I see you got two. So we'll wrap uh, Pendy around Paul. There's a good visual for you. And uh, Pendy. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's getting hot and steamy already. Um, <laughs> I was getting all wet from that Dave the Diver game, and now this. Oh, my God. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you know, guy with a big old spear is coming right at you. <laughs> Dangerous waters. Dangerous waters, indeed. All right. So, Penny, I, I, I look at some of your games, and I think uh, probably somebody on here out of uh, Yangus, Paul, and I have good amounts to say about all the games that you picked, too. So, uh, go ahead. You start, and we'll we'll chime in when we hear something good. Cool. So or we need fr- to correct you. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. I don't know what you're talking never. about at all. Where's Blue Star when we need her? <laughs> Actually, she's not oh. one of Oh, wait, wait. No. Well, actually, she's not on tonight. Love you, Blue Star. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks for the so, gifts. Oh, yes. They're wonderful. Thank you as well. And thank you, Platty, for your gifts. You, uh, Blue Star wasn't the only one uh, bringing tidings of joy to everyone into the podcast yes. realm. Yes, I kind of slipped some people. I admit in person some stuff this year. Got a little crafty myself. I need to get, I, I need to be full on Blue Star crafty and get everybody else next year. Nice, nice. Well, anyways, so my first game is Dragon Quest Monsters The Dark Prince. In Japan, it's Dragon Quest Monsters 3. This indicated that they wanted to go back to, you know, closer to the original Monsters formula instead of doing another Joker. Or so I assume. This also means that Caravan Hearts is not DQM3, as some people assumed. Sorry, what Kiefer. The hell? I know. Sorry, Kiefer. You and your awful food mechanic can go sit in the corner by yourself now. I'm, I'm very sorry. Let him starve to death over there. <laughs> you know, for this game, I'm in the middle of the post game. I, I rolled credits, and it has been a fantastic experience. Synthing Monsters is fun, but not actually the biggest highlight for me. Um, I know it is for many other people, but just, you know, monsters has never been my thing and, and it's been fun, but all the, all the, all the other parts of the game is what's been great for me. So, it, cause I, you know, I beat the game of all B level monsters. I wasn't going crazy with since I didn't mm-hmm. even have anything that was a, um, though I will have to step that up as I beat the first post game boss, but got absolute, absolutely bodied against the second one, so I'll have to step that up when I go to it later. I, I paused my playthrough of the game to try and finish up Super Mario RPG, and I'm glad I did. Um, as you, I, Palladia, as I know you know, uh, a recent patch that Square Enix put out the other day is going to make synthing the higher level monsters so much easier. More more gold and rainbow eggs and much more. Yes, yes. Yeah. That, that, so, that looks nice. It does. So if synthing monsters all day isn't my thing, what is it? Like I said before, just about everything else. The story, the characters, the level designs, all of it. I love the gameplay, the, I love the gameplay loop I did of exploring a new area, fighting the big bad, going back to recruit the new monsters and find any areas I missed, and then synthesizing some monsters before moving on to a new area. The exploration, the exploration is fantastic. There are four seasons for every area that you go to, and there's a lower, middle, and upper echelon for each area. Each season brings about different monsters in different areas that will be accessible, depending on what's going on. Seasonal changes can bring about such uh, differences as water freezing over, vines you can climb, rocks that will burst apart, lily pads to jump on, conveyances that will let you float over to other areas and such. And I loved how each layer of an echelon had a connected story to it. A good example would be the three Brimstone Boys. So you meet a different one on each level, and what they are trying to do affects the others. What the Brimstone what the Brimstone Boy accomplishes on the upper level would not work were not for the actions by his brothers on the lower and then the middle level. The overall story to me is really entertaining as well. Without going too much into it to avoid spoilers, it's basically an alternate Dragon Quest IV timeline from Pizarro's perspective. 
Uh, it's not strictly a prequel as some of us thought. You'll run into some iconic Dragon Quest IV moments and make your way through them trying to lift the curse that prevents you from harming other monsters that was put upon you by your father. There were just so many fun callbacks to Dragon Quest IV that it really got me into the urge to do another playthrough of that game, which I plan to do soon. I also loved the homages to the series, just as for as an example, like how you had to beat up four generals near the end of the game that were powering the barrier to the final castle, just like you did at the end of four. And that story scene right before you enter the final castle, chef's kiss, loved it so much. Uh, the characters and their designs are great. I loved Toil and Trouble, and I loved Rose. They were fun characters that really added to the story and the experience of the game for me. I had a great time with it. My only complaint was really just the performance issues. The game would chug here and there. There were stuttering, pauses, and I had a couple of crashes. And I, I've seen on the Discord that we have for Dragon Quest Monsters that other people have had problems with that as well, whether it be docked or not docked, or whether they had a physical copy or digital copy. I just was surprised that it was not better optimized for the Switch. Like with Treasures, maybe there will be a Steam port six months from now, and people will have a nicer, op you know, a nicer option to play this game. I hope but so. you know, yeah. Overall, I'm just really glad that I gave it a shot since I really don't play that many of the monster. I haven't played many of the monster games in the past. By far and away, one of my absolute favorites for 2023. Nice. I, I heard somebody talking this week about games like this that are obviously developed. They're third party, but they're developed for Switch. They didn't, I mean, as far as we know, this yeah. isn't being developed for anything else. You had one job. Develop your game for Switch. Make the assets, <laughs> make whatever work for Switch. The end. It's not the Switch's fault these things chug. Mm -hmm. like, come on. Yeah, you're developing for a system that's been out seven years. You know what the parameters are. Yeah, you had big open uh, worlds and treasures, and I don't remember any performance issues with treasures. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, treasures was, like, ran very smoothly, and you'd have a lot yeah. of monsters running around around there and everything mm -hmm. um I, i'll 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 be honest on my switch light i haven't noticed a lot but man i really noticed the pop in and pop out as i start walking suddenly there's a monster there it just pops up because like i feel like the draw distance isn't as good or, um, or you see them in the distance and they're kind of stuttering and they're like uh, uh, uh. oh oh heck yeah yeah when they're in the <laughs> distance they're they're moving at like three frames a second yeah <laughs> i mean it's, it's, it's like they're it's acting too bad. back they're doing like little flash dance do, 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 do. They're doing the robot, and then as you yeah. get closer... Yeah, it's just too bad, too, because the environments are just so amazing. At least I think they are. I love all the different environments. Oh. Like the, the candy land and the, the the mechanical area and all the different ones that they did. Like, it looks great. It just it just chugs a bit too much, and it's just, it just was disappointing that you ran into that. And I was hoping that the patch would solve these problems, but apparently the patch, in terms of technical um, things that they we're going to do is apparent they were supposedly going to fix the crashes which I, I saw on reddit that maybe that's not as good as they thought it was going to be and fix some bug some bugs but really not not general it performance really, it was not yeah, yeah that is nowhere no. in that patch notes mm -mm. i think official yeah. patch notes came out today oh on the english that side? Was the first time no they, they're still japanese they looked pretty official i'm like oh that's still that much supposed to be machine translation because oh, right at the end it. of it one of them i, I was reading i'm like that kind of sounds weird and at the end of one it was like i did this or something like that i'm like no <laughs> that's still machine translated mm, gotcha but uh no i it, we talking about the visuals yeah they look great and you know what it's not like hey this is your lava area although they have that hey here's your lava area hey here's your desert hey here's your ice place hey here's you you know you got some of those unique things too like the cities look pretty cool um although it killed me i think uh the first middle echelon one is a city and oh my god the maziness of it was crazy oh i think um, i know what you're talking about that was like the most difficult um area in the game where you had to go through all these buildings is that what you're talking about yep yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that was and that was I, uh, that took me a while to get through because that was not uh obvious of <laughs> how to get to places there and you know i think i was set up a little bit in, with the lower echelon stuff where basically you could warp to because most of the most of the areas you warp to the beginning there'll be a town or something somewhere in it and then there'll be like the uh dungeon or whatever the last part of that area yep. is and it's got like three warp points well in the city man i must have been going for two hours i was like well out of magic points um my team that actually my team right now still is way dependent on high level spells so it didn't get far into the city and i'm like running out of mp quite a bit <laughs> and i just kept going i'm like i was so overpowered unlike you i synth all the time 
And I was like, well, I'll keep going. I mean, this is kind of hard. I need to turn off my MP usage because I do need to heal after every about four or five battles. I'm I'm not completely immune here. And I played two hours until I got all the way to the end. And then I was like, oh, thank God. I'm here at the end. I see that little warp tile that I know somewhere in this final area I'll be able to warp back to this spot. Yep. And I go to Zoom, and there's like two other locations along the way. <laughs> and I was like, no, I could have. You could have, but the thing is, like, sometimes you check point to one of those checkpoints, and then you'll be like, oh, crap, I have no idea where I am, because it's so amazing. That, <laughs> that could have very easily happened to me, too, so, you know, whatever. But, I, I mean, it was not just, hey, you're in a field, hey, you're at the desert, hey, you're in the... Um, yeah, the dungeons but, and the envir- outside environments were, were very well done. That's one of the, the big highlights for me for that game. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I'll i talk later about what game bumped this off of my top three. But no, this is definitely really good. Um, I went and did something I really shouldn't have done. Uh, about the middle of November, I was like, you know, probably get review codes for this, even after the debacle with the review codes for Infinity Strash that never came through for Switch. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm sure I'll get the review code for this pretty soon with RP Gamer and... Um, I was like, I, I just want to get in the monster collecting mood. And I started playing uh, Terry's Wonderland again on the 3DS and restarted it because I'd played it on uh, Citra on the PC, but not on the thing. And sure enough, I sunk 60 hours into that in three weeks and didn't get the review code for this uh, until about three hours after I purchased it. <laughs> so uh, I, I graciously was like, hey, anybody else on RP Gamer want to take the review code and write the review? That's great. I'm heading to a cruise ship anyway. I know I won't be able to play for a week or two. So uh, well, I've got about 25 hours in. I If I would just stop synthing. <laughs> I, got, I looked at that. I looked at that. You update and Blue. And the, yep. The update to the uh, Joe's Trainer DLC. Yep. You can now have him refresh three times a day. Oh, dear God. That's going to kill settle me. What, and, uh, yeah. Instead of one. Yeah. And then what's the other one with the mole hole? You would go in and you can see monsters that you've already caught. Well, it used to be, I guess, only for about three or four weeks here. Um, you'd go in and if you were at like the F rank area, there might be six monsters running around. Once you fight all six of those, there's nothing else to do. So you can warp out, warp in, whatever, easily. But now they respawn. So I could just sit there for an hour at the F rank and catch 20 F ranked monsters just over and over and over again and then go have a synthing party again because now I can zoom straight to the synthing person. That's right. And there's supposed to be yep. a little gift in there, too, I think, with some uh, level up power balls or something like that. Yep. I, I, I saw that and I'm like, this this is going to delay my <laughs> progress in this game even more. But I couldn't be okay. happier. I couldn't be happier. It's, I'm, a, it's I'm, a great game. I was dreading having to to go to try and get all those gold and rainbow eggs because I know you have to get some of the monsters, uh, unique monsters from those eggs to get some of the higher echelon or the higher level monsters to be able to send them. And now that you mm-hmm. can get those so much more easily, I'm so I'm so glad for that. So now I don't have to sit around yeah. and hunt for eggs for hours upon hours. So what they do? Double the amount that show up, and then oh, like double or triple it or something like that. Like and then even the like reset, thirty percent. It wasn't oh, the like, reset, like a ridiculous amount of battles, and now it's 10. like one battle resets it all or something. Yeah, ten. It was ten. Now it's like one. Yep. So yeah, you can much easier. Go online, find yourself. Uh, I've seen so many people with like the maps, and then they've drawn the path. Yeah. Like just take this path, you'll pass by twenty different gold egg areas. So. Shout out to uh, Metal Kid and his website where he's got so many resources going. Oh, cool. And, awesome. Yeah, he's sharing all his data with uh, Wootus. So, nice. very nice. All right. Yangus, how's your uh, Dark Prince journey been? Uh, hold on one sec. Sorry, what was the question? How has your Dark Prince journey started? Uh, it's still two hours. I, I haven't really <laughs> played much since Christmas night. That's but, okay. Uh, That's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I got up to the point where, as I so delicately put it on a uh, the discord group we're, we're in um rose was real accepting of being locked away in a tower right away and just being like being pizarro telling her yo man i'm gonna keep you inside this tower okay cool cool all right see ya. <laughs> well not only that she was just like super excited and had to apologize for being overexcited about it boy oh. she was boy she, i was getting real simp vibes from her real fast in the beginning of that game she's like i want to work with you please 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 Whoa, but, calm down there, girl. I do I do like that she recognized it, though. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. That was a little much. <laughs> you know what's a little much? The fact that elves don't have names. Oh, that was that was interesting. Because everyone just assumed that she was um, named after the town or the town was named after her. And it was neither. Yeah. It, just, what a weird little detail to throw in there. Yeah. Like, I don't have a name. Well, uh, how about Rose? Let's go with that. <laughs> 
And honestly, an elf being like, we don't use a name, or we elves don't have it. That sounded like a pretentious thing an elf would say in a fantasy <laughs> thing, <laughs> setting. So. Exactly. It fits. We have no so it's like, okay, well, I guess we got culture. that G-Town now. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, whatever. Yeah, it was well, been fine from what little I've played. Um, I guess I'll have to play more of it at some point, but, you know, I'll get to it eventually. Been a little busy That's this a, week with work and stuff, so. That's all right. That's all right. All right, let's uh, pivot away from some Dragon Quest for a bit um, and get down to Paul. Paul, what was one of your top games this year? Well, I guess I can first tell you about Earth Defense Force 2025. Have you guys ever heard of the series? The EDF, yes, I've heard. I, I've never played it, but I hear it talked of lovingly quite often. Only because you've mentioned it before. Otherwise, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a kind of a cult series, you know, like it. it's never been truly mainstream, but has a lot of fans and so earth defense force 2025 is not the newest one like edf6 is coming to steam and playstation in uh, early 2024 in english but it's been out in japan for a, a year so that that's what we're up to is part six well edf 2025 is actually the fourth game in the series although there's there's really more than four of them but in Japan, it was called EDF4. So um, it was released on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 back in the day. The 360 version is actually better, which is nice. But anyway, it was recently on sale for eight bucks on on the Xbox store and it's backwards compatible. So I've been playing it on the Xbox One. I'm sorry, Xbox Series X, not Xbox One. Anyway. Um, but it's it's a classic, and I've played it a bunch back when it came out, and I still really like it. You know, the the premise is that the Earth is being attacked by aliens, and you know, you're you pick a class from several choices. There's four classes in this one, and most of them, and you just um, you take on a large number of missions. You know, there's always a ton. Like this one has like. 80 something missions so quite a lot and some of them are really long and some of them are short but it's just like you get a lot of meat out of this game even though it's not an rpg it's kind of rpg like in length like it's just designed to be very grindy but in a really pleasurable addictive way in my opinion because not only do you have all these 80 something levels but each one you're encouraged to beat it on all five difficulties that they offer and um, because, you know, it contributes to your completion rate. And when you're playing online, if you have a, co- a total online completion rate of 70% or higher, then you can turn off weapon and armor limits. Because normally there's these limits that keep you from using overpowered equipment on in online levels. If you're playing single player, there's no such limits. But in online, they want they want it to be challenging for everybody. But if you actually play a whole lot to get your completion rate up high enough, then you can turn off those limits and everybody can join you and play with like their best equipment on easier levels, you know, and they can have the the greatest amount of health because that's what the armor limit thing is. It's a restriction to how much health you can have. So anyway, you're just encouraged to work towards that very long term goal. And um, I don't know, it's fun, you know, like I have those limits turned off, but I still have a lot more, you know, like. I could play it every day for the rest of the year of, of 2024 and maybe not even complete every single difficulty with every single character, but it's so fun. And it's four player co-op. So working together and, you know, using different classes or even the same class, you know, like there's a lot of advantages to the different classes and um, weapon drops, you know, like enemies can drop health armor upgrades or they can drop weapons. You don't see what you got until you beat the level. So it's sort of like a gotcha because when you beat the level, it's like, oh, I got eight weapons that I already have, but I got two new weapons, you know? And it's really fun chasing after those weapons that you don't have. So there's a whole lot to like about this game, and it runs really well on the Xbox, you know, the newer Xbox consoles, being that it's an older game and it's backwards compatible. But the loading times are still... They're not taking full advantage of the SSD of the series S and X, you know, like I guess it's somewhat hard coded how long the loading is going to be. So it doesn't load instantly like it should. Like if you play EDF five or six on PS5, you're going to get way faster loading. But that's that's just a little thing. But, you know, like cooperative games are my favorite style of game, you know, different genres. But I love the cooperative aspect. The series has a great cooperative aspect and lots and lots of replay value. But also it's got a nice B movie vibe to it. You know, like uh, the aliens, a lot of them are kind of wacky, giant insects and giant robots and things like that. 
and they um you know the the writing there's a lot of narration while you play there's not very many cinematics where you're not when you're not playing but there's lots of just narration that tells you how things are going in the world and the different soldiers that are on your team you know they'll make funny comments so it, it just has this really unique special charm to it and there's nothing else quite like it so that's edf 2025 baby have you played many of those games muted. in the series <laughs> oh whoops no you're good Okay. I was muted. I actually meant to say, I, I tried to get my question in there and then realized, no, nope, I'm still muted. Have you ever played many of the other ones? <clears throat> yeah, basically, I started with 2017, which is the third game in the series that was released mm -hmm. on 360. So from that point on, I've played them all. You know, like I, I got the ones they released on the Vita. I get the ones they put on Steam and PlayStation. Unfortunately, 2025 is the last mainline game in the series released on Xbox. You know, like Xbox is my favorite, although I have all the platforms. So, mm -hmm. and some people, you know, like some of my co-op friends, they will not buy a PlayStation, you know, so they don't get to play the newer EDFs with me. And that's a shame. So, um, you know, back in the day, Microsoft was paying Japanese developers to release their games on the 360. Mm -hmm. And that stopped at a certain point. And maybe they're doing it a little more now, you know, like I think they make deals with Square Enix to release some of their games on, on Xbox. But I just wish Microsoft would continue to get those games released because it's better to have games available on the widest number of platforms, you know? Yes, it does. I mean, I, as a game, not that I've done this, but if I was a game developer, wouldn't I want it to have it out there everywhere? Like sell more copies, have people double, triple dip. That whatever. is true. It's have a little harder. for Jap <laughs> Definitely. Japanese developers usually aren't using Unity or sometimes mm. they might use Unreal, but a lot of times they're using their own custom engines or, or Japanese engines. And those things are not designed to be as portable to different platforms, you know, Correct. so that's. That's one impediment, but I still wish they would. Why can't they all just use RPG Maker? It's so brilliant. It is. You get stuff like Dragon Quest. Was it Reborn? What did we get that? Was that this year? Yeah, that was really neat. The fan I, game. I need to yeah. play it. Yeah, so. that might be my game of the year for my game of the year for next year, depending on how well the playthrough goes. Because I want to <laughs> try that out. Yeah, I, I actually need to. I haven't replayed it since I, I spent, gosh, like ten hours. I think I only got five hours into it, but I did a little restart, a lot of restarting when we talked to uh, Nightcrawler back in. I think it was September. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of beta. I, I can't. I must have emailed him twenty times in, in a weekend and was like, "Oh, I just want to make sure I told you that you know, since I'm playing a beta copy, like, hey, this is misspelled. This is this way. This is that way." Um, and he's like, no, 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 keep them coming, keep them coming. He goes, that's great that you're doing that. And then, yeah, when it finally came out in November, I was knee deep in a million other things and haven't gotten around to it. And somebody told me that I'm in the game somewhere. Someone's like, oh, we see you, Platty. I'm like, oh, wow. that's awesome. Or there's a mention of me or something. Like, it's funny because I found Nightcrawler in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's sitting up in uh, the town in the top right corner of Dragon Quest 1. I'm guessing it doesn't take too long to beat either, because like the original, I mean, you think Dragon Quest 1 takes like 8 to 9 hours, and this is like an expanded version of it, basically, so what, like 12, 16, some, somewhere in there? I, I think, uh, I mean, my timer was at 5, and I was ready to get, and I had the rainbow drop, so I never went to the, uh, or to make the rainbow bridge. I think I made the bridge and kind of saved there and was like, oh, okay. so Oh, that's pretty short, too. Oh, okay, cool. But he's got a whole post game. Like there were places uh, that I kept walking around to, and it was like, "Why don't you try coming back here once you have defeated the Dragon Lord? Once you mm -hmm. take care, you can come in or something like that." So yeah, I've heard that it, there's stuff to make it a, about a dozen or fifteen hours to play around with. Nice. So. Does it let you All stay right. in a hotel with Princess Gwalyn? <laughs> I don't know. I don't that know was in one of the Japanese ones, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some of the remakes and and when they brought them over here, but yeah. What have you two uh, been doing? <laughs> we'll have to find out. Uh, that's Dragon Quest Untold right there. <laughs> we won't tell you what they were doing. All right. So, Yangus, do you want to go first or you want me to do one of mine? Uh, yeah, I can go ahead and talk about one of mine. All right. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so for my first one, I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about uh, you're going to notice a theme with all three of my games. They'll happen to be related to the same company uh, <laughs> in a form. But uh, yeah, so my first one I'm talking about is a Theat Rhythm Final Curtain Call, a.k.a. the Final Fantasy Rhythm game. Uh, so released in early 2023 on Switch and PS4, uh, this is the latest entry of the Theat Rhythm line of games from Square Enix, uh, bringing together Final Fantasy music from games from all over this, this long running series. Uh, this game sees a massive track list of songs. I think it's about 600 with all the DLC and over 100 playable characters to assemble parties from. 
Uh, this game tells That's a story of love and betrayal, of villains who turn over a new leaf, of a war-torn land overcoming strife and squall to find the sacred dagger back to... Nah, just kidding. This is a rhythm game. There's no plot. All you gotta do is play to your heart's content. Uh, jokes aside, though, there is a little bit of a story. Uh, taking some cues from the Dissidia Final Fantasy games, uh, the many worlds and characters of the series have begun to cross over, and it comes down to the many heroes to travel through each game or, uh, in some cases, the specific sub-series of a game, uh, completing each song and eventually defeating Chaos itself. With the power of music, baby! Uh, players can unlock new songs and characters by completing the story quests, or series quests as they're called, uh, with each unlocked world giving players access to a select number of characters from that particular game uh, to assemble a party from. Uh, get far enough into a into a series quest level, and you'll earn another key to unlock another game's playlist. Uh, fully complete a game's playlist of songs, and you unlock uh, vil playable villains of that game, uh, in most of their cases, uh, to play as, and you also get some bonus content like uh, FMVs based on cutscenes from each original release of the games. Uh, if you complete all of the series quest, you'll get to, not only you'll unlock a special mode where you, it's essentially kind of like a randomizer mode, uh, kind of like a roguelike S mode, but you'll also get to play through a special song featuring uh, battle themes from all over the mainline entries before the credits roll. And that was a that was a cool surprise to get to play through that song. Uh, but anyway, characters are divided into a number of types, such as attack, defense, healer, uh, mage, summoner, and uh, so on. Uh, the right party can really make the difference when the game throws ailments and some of the higher difficulties at you, uh, especially if you are playing on the uh, randomizer mode uh, that you unlock once you beat all the story stuff. But uh, if you, but you know, you're more than welcome to use whatever characters you want. Uh, you're not required to do any of this customization stuff. Plus, if you, you know, you're not that concerned with the RPG elements of the game, you can just pick whatever character you like. Uh, I really like that the game, you know, rewards players for planning ahead, you know, just like a lot of the mainline games, or, uh, or sorry, uh, but I'm also glad that players, you know, aren't outright punished if they want to stick with a, you know, certain team of characters. Like, you know, let's say you love the characters from Final Fantasy VIII, you want to stick with that team of characters while you play. You know what? You're more than welcome to. The game's not going to be like, hey, you got to switch. Uh, anyway, Anyway, gameplay is pretty identical to the previous The Rhythm titles. Uh, players can select from series quests, uh, free play mode, and play online, or the unlockable mystery path mode uh, for your game mode options. Uh, you also have a collectible area where you can see like all of the items and cutscenes and all that kind of good stuff. You know, if you want to take a look at that, or your records. Uh, so, from the playable options for the different like song for the song gameplay. Uh, players then select their song, they get to select the difficulty level, and, and you know, like most rhythm games, just have to make it to the end of the song to uh, beat it. Uh, the closer you are to hitting the notes on the beat slash when, the, uh, when they align with the cursor on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the better score you will have by the end of the song. Um, along the way, in most every quest, you'll be defeating enemies and encountering different... Um, monsters from throughout the whole series uh defeating them you know will reward your experience points uh for your active party and you can also obtain items such as potions phoenix downs and special collector cards which if you uh collect those they can help boost some of the stats of your characters by a little bit and there's different levels of them too so it's fun to see you know what each level of a card looks like um players uh, can also choose a few different control uh, schemes depending on what their preference are. So you can play with just the standard controls where you have normal hits, uh, directional notes and buttons where you have to hold the button and slide the control up and down uh, to keep and beat with the song. Uh, you can play two-player co-op mode locally, or you can choose a simple mode where you just have to hit the buttons in time with the song and you don't have to worry about doing any... Uh, you don't have to worry about the slide notes or directional stuff. Uh, you can also play online with up to three other players, uh, be they friends or strangers. And you can even play with some special effects turned on to try and throw off your opponents. And Or you can play just good old, or keep a classic, see who can do the best they can in a difficulty setting. And there you go. Um... So personally, I got a lot of time out of this entry, a lot more than I expected to this year. Uh, I got getting about uh, 120 hours or so throughout the year as I would play. Uh, it's been a great game to pop in and play for a while, uh, especially since I've enjoyed previous entries from the Theat Rhythm uh, series from Square Enix. And uh, with all of the playable modes and customization options, uh, there's plenty of ways to play, which I really enjoy. Uh, all the DLC also helped in some new and and some returning songs from past the Rhythm games. Uh, and we also got songs for some other Square Enix properties like uh, Saga. We got some stuff 
from Xeno Gears, the Mana series. And uh, as a surprise, uh, the last batch of DLC was I think about 11 or 12 songs from Final Fantasy 16. And that was pretty that was pretty cool, actually, because there's some really great songs from that game. Uh, I found that this has been a fun game to just go back to and revisit and putting together or trying to put together different teams of characters, uh, you know, find some good synergy with abilities, try out different combos, um, and trying to see if I can get, uh, you know, perfect, or as the game calls it, like critical charts across all of them. Uh, just trying, you know, and just replaying songs that I like a lot. Oh, and also um, trying to attempt to fully complete all of the missions from each series quest. And boy, there's some that are real doozy. Like the one for the end of Final Fantasy One, where you got to beat uh, Chaos that shows up as a boss. I looked into it because I'm like, okay, there's got to be some sort of trick to this guy. Yeah, his stats are just absolutely boosted. So you need to have like your characters be crazy high level just to have a chance of possibly beating him. <laughs> it's crazy. But it's fun, though. I like trying to beat all these different little quests that they have and... Uh, unlocking stuff from each game because if you complete all the quests you unlock a bunch of artwork and other little details and things like that so uh, admittedly though i wasn't really sure how this series was going to work on a home console release but you know honestly this is a game that's like the perfect fit on the nintendo switch whether i've played it in handheld or on the tv uh, i would definitely recommend this game if you uh, enjoy rhythm games you know you're a fan of final fantasy you love the music from Nobuo Uematsu and all the other composers who have worked on the series over the years. Or if you're just looking for something with lots of team customization to uh, conquer challenges. So yeah, um, I, I've heard the PS4 version's pretty good too, but I would personally recommend the Switch one so you can play it on the go. Really, it's it runs very well on Switch, and honestly, it's a perfect fit on the console. So yeah, that would be my first game to talk about tonight. So there we go. I need to get that. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I played the first one, uh, the first Final Fantasy Theat Rhythm. I don't think there was any story whatsoever in that one, but it didn't matter. It was just a really fun game. And I have the Dragon Quest one. Me too. Which it doesn't matter, you know, if I know any Japanese or not, because again, there's no story and you're just kind of middling your way through it. But I just don't have a DS that can play it yet. So one of these days I'll, oh. I'll play that one. Yeah, usually just the the story for these is just, oh, uh, some weird force is causing all these worlds to collide. Use the power mm. of music to put everything back together. That's, gotcha. that's pretty much the plot. <laughs> <laughs> and like all yeah, these theater something. rhythm games, like even the second one on the 3DS kind of made fun of that too. And it's like, uh, chaos is striking again. The power of music must save the day. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's a good time. I, I would recommend uh, picking this game up if you haven't already. Yeah, because I, I was I never got into rhythm games, but the, playing the first one, you know, if you love the music, then it's just a good time. It's it's nothing. And like you said, like some of these games have simple modes and whatnot. So it's it's always it's always fun to to play through the music and have all the different characters that you can have uh fighting along your way as you're put pressing all the buttons and rhythm and yeah i had a good time with it oh much more accessible than the uh, center and kigura bon appetit definitely <laughs> but uh no that uh, the dragon quest one obviously i played that one and put like 15 hours into it the best part of the dragon quest one is they have tnt boards and i've played it a lot i think i've opened like 18 to 20 and they just keep going i'm like oh my god there's more tnt boards so cool little thing that they add to the dragon quest one yeah I'm that one they have. Some. yeah it's got nowhere near the uh track list that this one does that'd be awesome if we could get a dragon quest one for modern consoles again one day yeah and put more TNT boards in. Woo-hoo. Yes, always love the TNT boards. I'm looking forward to playing those when I eventually play the the Dragon Quest the Rhythm game. And, and again, you muddle your way through it pretty easily um, with the menus and everything. It's just you know getting to that button press and A is A, B is B, L and R, whatever. It's all the same. Yeah, it's pretty easy to just muddle through. It's really not that difficult. And yeah, especially if you played one of the Final Fantasy ones, yep. they look they they look the same. Yeah, yeah poor, poor Barurian, though, is mad because he doesn't know how I unlocked the uh, the gold ticket for the TNT stuff in the Dragon Quest one, and I still don't know how I did it. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> I wish I knew, but I really don't. I just suddenly had the thing that's like, oh, okay, I guess I can play whenever I want to now. <laughs> hey, I don't even know that. I don't know how. Yeah, hey, I, I wish I knew so I could tell people, but I, I just kind of got it at some point. I'm like, oh, OK, I guess I can play whenever now. But <laughs> hey, if you I, just keep yeah, playing, I, you'll eventually get it, too. <laughs> I'll you know what? I feel like I, I like more than a few times I got worried because I was dipping below like eight TNT tickets. And here I am. I'm like board 20 and I've got like 25 of them. Like I, sooner or later. Oh, yeah. Like luck might much. run out. But I've just yeah, I, I never reached a point where like, oh, I can't play TNT anymore. Yeah, the game will throw a bunch at you. So you don't need to ever yep. worry too much about uh, running out, which is yeah. nice. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to 
kind of go in order that I played this year. Um, and top three, these could really go, well, the first two definitely are top. But uh, Octopath Traveler 2 was a game that I was super excited to get a chance to review this year. Um, as I've said many times, I write for RP Gamer. Um, and when I joined back in 2019, 2018, I think, um, nobody reviewed Octopath Traveler 2. I think I was on staff for about eight, nine months, and I was like, oh, we don't even have a review for the first Octopath game. Um, and there were a couple people that were like, yeah, I was going to review it. Yeah, I played it a lot. But there were so many people that were so divided by it, by the, especially the whole storytelling aspect of it. The first game was very segmented. You know, you had your eight people. Each of them had their own story. And unless you went deep into post-game, finding all the stuff and following along with all this that wasn't obvious, there was really no connection between them. Um, and I was okay with that. I was like, cool, I just got eight awesome little stories here. Um, they had eight hours each. I got 32 little mini stories. They were. It was a perfect game to like pick up. I'm going to play for two hours tonight. I'm going to do a chapter and be done. And I loved it. I gave it a 4.5. I thought it was wonderful. Um, it kicked off the whole HD 2D stuff um, and went on my way. So my editor this year is like, hey, you wrote the first one. You want Octopath Traveler 2? I was like, yes, I would love Octopath Traveler 2. So got it. And I couldn't quite beat it by the uh, day that the uh, you could post reviews. The embargo was over because there was a couple little obscure things right at the end I needed help from. I joined a uh, Discord about Octopath Traveler 2, and I finally beat it like two days after release because, you know, some people on that server had gotten it a day early or stayed up for like 48 hours straight and were already like finishing the game. And I was like, oh, my God, like this is taking me two weeks to get to this point. You're there in two days and teaching me how to do things. Um, but I, I wrote a review of this game and gave it a perfect five out of five. Like it, the game wasn't perfect. The whites get a little washed out with the lighting, I think was a little bit, um, too bright compared to the last game. Uh, but oh my God, it, it, this thing did everything. Uh, it, it addressed the number one complaint that people had of the first game right ahead with the no interaction. I felt I got tons of cutscenes based on the characters in your party, because you can only have four at a time. Um, and I wish they would change it to like all these cutscenes play, because I'm like, oh my gosh, I played through the party. And if I walked into this town over here and I only had these four, like it wouldn't trigger certain cutscenes unless you had the right two or the right three people. And that, but I mean, I felt like I lucked out a lot of times. I got so many cutscenes with three. And I think one time I had a cutscene with four characters in it. And I'm like, oh my God, I just kind of lucked out by having those in my party right then. Um, they did have little stuff like that in the first but where this one really went ahead was they had these cross path chapters instead of just the main chapters like Hikari chapter one, Hikari chapter two, Hikari chapter three. They had these cross path chapters where they took two of the eight characters and put them together on a little journey. And uh, they were usually shorter chapters. They were definitely shorter than the chapters that would be part of the main eight storylines going but it, it, it had them working together. They would talk to each other. They would do things. Um, like, I know the, what was his name? Part, not Particio. Um, uh, there, there's a guy who's a investigator from the church. And, like, the one that he was teamed up with, they were actually investigating something. So it kind of went together with both their stories at the same time. So those are pretty cool. And then at the end, their stories came together. There was a um, real finale. Um, when you completed everybody's stories, there was something that was very obvious that led you to a big boss battle at the end so there was like a real final battle um and holy shit that boss battle was completely epic um it had a little different mechanic to it that hadn't been in the entire game um that just made it really really epic and i i just kept thinking oh my god i'm just gonna fail here anyway because i was not prepared for this at all um and i managed to uh through another feature of the game cheese my way through the end um because something else it did in the first game, you could always have, you know, everybody had their own class. So say you had your dancer person, um, everybody could subclass later on in the game. There's ways to open it. And the subclasses that you could only have one other person. So if you had your dancer party person in, you could have one other dancer in your party, have somebody subclasses dancer. And that was it. Well, in this game, you could get up to three extra, I don't know, I'm thinking of Bravely Default here with the little coin or whatever the star that you got that let you do that job. But 
they were all all the jobs were kind of unique in how you got that. Um, the one that I actually spent a lot of time on was there's this guy, Particio, and he was his chapter that he starts out with was like Wild West digging for gold, the bringing the train to the town to become prosperous. Um, just a cowboy merchant guy. He, he wanted to buy stuff and make the world a better place. Um, just a hope. I don't know like what it was a hopeless romantic kind of, but he, he just thought that technology and through money and doing all this, he could just make the world an interconnected place with it. And if it was all interconnected, it'd be way better. And just everybody would be happier and better off in life. And so that's his path through the game. Um, but he was a merchant. And one of the merchant skills you can do is in battle, you can spend money like eh, call an army this turn for like twenty thousand dollars and like eight guys come and beat up the who you're fighting and do like epic damage. But there's different levels to that. And I had so much money at the end. I had a couple people subclassed in that more than one subclass in that. And I was able to pay to win basically <laughs> with in-game money. Um, definitely everybody else helped along the way too. But uh, I did start off like the first game, the first game, the thief I thought was way overpowered and I'd read some guides before hand like where i could go and where i could steal good stuff early in the game so i did with this one having it you know a couple weeks before release i knew nothing but i'm like yeah i'm gonna take the thief again uh her name was throne a and holy shit like her story was just batshit crazy it starts off she's an assassin or whatever and um she's got these people called mother and father they're not really her mother and father they're the head of whatever assassin guild she's part of and you know at the beginning like you're off to do assassin work and then you don't really like it and you don't want to be a killer and whatever and you, you want to break out of this kind of stuff and right away i noticed hey the chapter situation here is not the same as the original game the original game eight people four chapters each 32 chapters boom set um in this game some people had five chapters some people had three chapters uh sometimes they would branch throne a had like a chapter i can't remember if it was two or three but it was like 2a and 2b because you could go talk to mother or you could go talk to father and the level requirements or not requirements but the recommended level for those were pretty equal it was like hey you can go do chapter 2a or 2b right now um, they're both good if you're about at level 10, um, which is something else that was different in this game. Uh, the first game, I felt the level requirements, there was a big jump. Like, obviously, all the chapter ones were like, you could do it from the beginning, level one. But then, like, all the level twos were like, recommended level 15. And they're like, holy crap, like, I'm not level 15 yet. I've done all these first chapters, and I'm not let that there. Um, there was a lot of chapters in this one. It was like, hey, this is good if you're level six, or this one's good if you're level 10 or level 12 or 14. So, um, um, while I didn't follow that and it wasn't an ideal path for the way I wanted to play, you could. Um, I was grinding. I was finding out that, you know, I've played a lot of games with battle systems similar to this. And I, I could find out the cheesy ways to do stuff and like the merchant tr trick or whatever near the end. Um, like any job system game, there's so many ways that you can find to do awesome damage or whatever. Um, I think someone who kind of broke the game for me a bit was uh, Ochette. Um, she grew up on an island and her island was all about catching and using monsters in battle. And she was way better than, gosh, the broken English girl that was in the first game that was all about that. Um, oh, Ochet was just awesome. Like, I, I can't, I think it might have been around her end of chapter two, maybe beginning of chapter three, that I caught a bunch of level eight um, monsters. Uh, they had little ranks eight through ten. And so many of them had um, awesome AoE spells. Like, this will hit everybody with lightning damage twice. And uh, part of the battle system in the Octopath Travelers is you want to be able to break enemies. Enemies have a shield up. You can do some damage. But really, you can do massive damage and cause them to miss one or two turns, depending on when you hit them. Um, if you can break them, they'll have a little number of them that like, hey, this guy's got a shield of level three. And it shows that they're weak to three things. You don't know what three things those are until you actually do it. So it's a lot of trial and error when you're meeting new enemies. But once you hit them with something that um, breaks their barrier bit, it's permanently above them for the rest of the game. You'll always see that. So having people with area of effect spells that could like hit everybody with fire, you'd walk in if there's three new enemies. Like, I don't know if these guys are weak to fire. Let me cast fire on them here. And then the next turn, let me cast lightning on them all. And pretty quickly, you'd start seeing like who was weak to what 
and could break them pretty quickly. So love to chat. Um, Particio, the cowboy, was a favorite. Um, <laughs> thrown a story by the time you got to the end of it. Off the wall, thousands of year old, what the fuck kind of stuff was going on there. Um Oswald was kind of a what the fuck, holy shit kind of thing right from the beginning. Um, his family had been killed and he was framed. And it was an interesting mechanic. I saved him for last because I went to do him, I think, chapter the second or third time. And immediately it was like, you won't be able to pick anybody else for two chapters. Do you want to do this? And I was like, oh, my God, no, I want to I want to keep playing. I don't want to be locked in this guy for two chapters. But he was uh, he was locked on a he was basically in their version of Alcatraz. <laughs> You're stuck on an island jail in the middle of a cold area and had to get out to try to free your name and figure out who had killed your family. And although his first few chapters were pretty quick, by the time I went and did them, I was like, oh, again, not knowing anything before the game. I was like, I thought to be locked into this guy for like four hours and his first two chapters maybe were an hour total. But it was just awesome. They added some really cool stuff from the first game. Uh, the battle system was almost untouched. They did have, add a like a super attack that, you know, throughout the battle, you could build up um, power and then unleash a really big thing. At one point, that ended up being kind of helpful. Just a little touch to an already great system. Uh, the sound, the music, like this is a game, and I've said it a lot of times, like, what? Music? There's music in that game? I did not want to keep this game on mute. I was playing it all the time. It really just sounded amazing. The soundtrack, I think I gave that a 5 out of 5. And uh, usually when we go through editing process, someone will kind of listen to a few tracks and someone who was editing mine was like, no, 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 you, you're right. You're right on the ball there. That's, that's some awesome music. Um, they added a day night cycle, um, which was really cool because everybody's got these different path actions. Um, thrown a, the thief obviously steals, but, um, Oh, Chet, uh, with the monsters could use, uh, I think she could use monsters. Yangus, did you play this all the way? Uh, I mean, I'm like 30 hours in. I didn't, I didn't know Chet because I had the same problem as the first game where I, I've loved it a lot, but it just take my sweet ass time getting through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely you can on this one. There's so much to do, um, and you could just take everybody to every town and just. Well, that's uh, the I thing too. Of, like this is a game where it's like perfectly structured, where you can play a chapter or two, and you can go play. Because like I, I'm like that where I got done with doing something with the character, and I was like, hey, you know, I'll go play something else for now, or I get a few chapters yeah. done, and I'd be like, and I play something else for now. Never was that a boredom uh, of the game. It just was. It's just perfectly structured like that. Mm -hmm. What I thought was awesome. I, I said the writing was just amazing in this game, and down to the little details. Basically, every townsperson that you could talk to had like a big paragraph about themselves details, um, and there was different ways to find out about that. You could walk up and. If um, one of your guys was like certain level, he was he could just ask them and they would tell them about themselves or one guy could like discern what was going on with them. Um, different path actions. Yeah, there was a ceiling from the thief. Um, some people could just challenge people to duels because most uh, people would have an item with them. So, you know, some people could thrown a could steal that item. Somebody else could challenge them to a duel. And if you won that duel, you'd get it. Um, much like how Ochet could take a person or take a monster, catch a monster during the game and then keep unleashing it kind of like a spell. Um, when she wanted, there was ways to recruit people to your party for a while and they would fight with you a certain number of times. It wouldn't be permanent. They, whereas the monsters would be permanent. You could use them the whole rest of the game. The people would maybe have like 10 charges or something like that. You could mm -hmm. coerce them to be with this. Um, but everybody had these path actions and everybody actually had two because at night their path actions were different during the day. And it was awesome to switch between day and night. Like it doubled the soundtrack. Every city had a day theme and a night theme. And mm -hmm. uh, gosh, like and like I said, the, the details of the characters were like I I was just amazed. And I think I screenshotted one here that, that I've seen other people talk about too. There was just this random guy in this one town that I think there was a thieves guild or the assassins guild had like somebody there or whatever. And it was just townsperson. They didn't even give a name. Townsperson, an unremarkable man, born and raised in town. 
His remarkable constitution makes him entirely immune to almost any poison. Although he is unaware of this, the local underworld has figured it out, and the betting on who will successfully poison him first is getting fierce. That's hilarious. And uh, Yeah, I mean, there was just random ones like this all over the place. Yes. Uh, gosh, there was one girl that like had a teddy bear and like like she was very protective of the teddy bear and if you like ask her about it she's like um gosh what was it the teddy bear eats dreams feeds yeah, off like her dreams evil. yeah yeah but she's only got bad dreams so they've worked out this deal that like she's only got nightmares and he just eats all her nightmares so it's fine or something like that there's it like it's a very weird thing but it works for them or something like that there was just so many people that like i was like oh my god i gotta read that again and again and again like just that one paragraph added so much to little Yep. People that you wouldn't even do any, that you don't have to do anything with in the game. Yeah, there's one NPC that stood out to me in the coastal area where uh, she's blocking a path to a treasure. But when you talk to her and try and get information from her, it mentions like she's waiting for her lover who said that uh, that he would meet her there. Well, then you get to where it says how old that the character oh. is because most everybody has their age listed. It says she's yes, like 130 years old, but she looks just like a young woman. And I'm just like, I wonder if this is like a. And it's probably just because I was thinking of Dragon Quest 11 at the time. I'm like, I wonder if this is like a mermaid story where she's a mermaid and like, but she's in human form waiting for her, uh, you know, her human lover to come and meet her for some. You know, she's waiting for him on this in this coastal beach area, half submerged in water. You know. <laughs> Did you did you find the boy? No, I like I said, I'm only like 20 hours in. I I I, I won't I'm, spoil what happens when you find him. Yeah, so don't yeah, don't tell me anything. So yeah, because you like I said, you can coerce people to come with you. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I there's a lot of these things where you're talking about on. people. Yeah. yeah, you'll you'll run into him somewhere, and then you use the path action to coerce, and then go back, and he'll talk to her. And mm-hmm. um, that one had definitely a surprisingly different outcome than I thought it would have. So, um. Yeah, it, it it's just it, I thought every like I said five out of five, um, like objectively I think one of the best games that I've played in many years. I mean, subjectively I love my Dragon Quests way more and farming games a lot, but like in terms of the wide world of RPGs, like this was just awesome. Huh. So that's my Octopath Traveler too. And, and Boogaloo. What's up? Yeah, I had a question and, about it. Uh, so for the first game, I remember one of the, the big complaints about it was that um, the stories were all very separate and they didn't mm-hmm. really overlap with each other at all. So in this game, there's more of that where there's a little bit of overlapping between different character stories. Yes. Yeah. And there's actually entire chapters where there are two characters together doing stuff together. Nice. So, That's I crazy. mean, grand, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, they're, they're still disconnected. But okay. like I said, I felt like this one had a ridiculous amount of side content. Like, I, I'd walk into a town and I'd walk into the local bar because that's where you can always flip out characters or um, like if you screw up your path actions, if you keep failing at stealing or whatever, um, and it was kind of like the first game, eventually the town would be pissed at you and you wouldn't be able to talk to anybody for a while. Um, and you'd have to go to the bar and bribe the bartender to make everybody like you in town again. Now, I, I that never happened to me because I would always save scum galore. But whatever. If you don't save scum, that could happen because um, all these different things have chances of not working. You have a chance of challenging someone to a duel or trying to coerce them and it completely failing, much like stealing. But um, no, they had those whole chapters where they work together. But a lot of times you would walk into places and if you had certain people in your party, you'd activate the cutscenes. And like I said, there, there was just some hilarious ones with the characters. Um, one, like three of them were getting drunk and Hikari, the warrior, was like, oh, I don't drink. And they were just chatting with him and Particio was talking about playing cards. And he's like, oh, but I will, you know, soberly beat you guys at cards while you're all drunk and something like that. So there was a lot of little character things like that. And then, yeah, there were four um, actual storylines that involved pairs of them and when you got into the final part like once you completed everybody's story they actually talked to each other like to go through the final story because i think that was a big part people didn't either like there's like a lot well, people don't talk to each other in the game it's like you're there you're doing particio's story the other three characters are mainly acting like you know dragon quest three you know you, you're just bringing along your random mages and whatever with you um it's not like the real characters but especially towards the end they had group of eight interaction and there's lots of those paired chapters cross paths nice. they called them so yeah they addressed that really head on very so. nice 
came out very early in the year. I know, you know, turn-based JRPGs don't get a lot of love at Game Awards and everything, but I I think this was one of the best games of the year for turn-based lovers, for old school kind of because i mean this, this these octopath games and like yeah. bravely default they're they're looking at that final fantasy pixel nostalgia and just cranking it up to modern systems but all right let's see pendy are you ready to go next i suppose <laughs> yes so my second game that i'm gonna be talking about tonight is going to be infinity stretch And while I loved what it did in a lot of respects, I was sad that it didn't live up to its full potential here and there. You know, going out and playing as Dai and his friends in this action RPG is a lot of fun overall. Eventually, you're going to have party members such as Dai, Pop, Ma'am, and Hyunkle in your party. They all get their signature moves which allows for great variety in the gameplay as you slowly learn them all. You have two basic attacks, and the signature spells or abilities that can be assigned to three different other buttons. There's also a coup de grace move, and some of the characters' uh, coup de grace moves uh, progress as you go through the game. You can get multiple ones. You get more than one. Uh, you eventually get, you also eventually get a second version of Hyunkle and Nam as well with their own movesets as they kind of character change, you get a character class change as they do mm-hmm. in the anime. So the variety of moves, the variety of moves that you can get throughout the game ensures that the battles are always evolving, changing, and a lot of fun. That that part was great. I never got bored with that. I also really enjoyed how you could power up your characters. There was the traditional leveling leveling that you'd expect from just beating up the bad guys, but you could also find these bond memory cards. They would initially showcase a scene from the manga, which was really cool, but they also served as a way to power up your characters. They could affect certain stats or even specific abilities depending on what the card was. And they could be leveled up separately in the Temple of Recollect the Temple of Recollection, which was a randomly generated dungeon mode. In those dungeons you could run into monsters, various monsters and bosses. Uh, there was even a a special boss not seen in the main story mode that you go up against eventually. And as you kept going lower, as you kept going deeper, deeper into the dungeon, the challenges the dungeon floors would off they, that they would offer would be very interesting sometimes. You might run into multiple bosses on the same floor, which could be scary, or there was environmental hazards, such as flames bursting from the floor, or waves of flazzard rocks trying to take you down, which if you know the anime, you know what I'm talking about, or, or even fighting Flazard earlier in the game when he does that to you. You know, I really loved how the main story missions would get inventive sometimes, too. For example, when you're sneaking around Yunkle's dump... <clears throat> Sneaking around Hyunkle's dungeon, stealth was the key. Or he got mobbed by monsters that a guard would signal for. Or how in the battle against Crocodile, as Pop, you actually have a mission where you collect the pieces of his magic staff while avoiding the boss so that he can prepare his glimmer spell to set Grandpa Brass free from the influence of the Dark Army. So I, I love how they interp- or they uh, kind of put that into the gameplay, what was going on in the story from the anime and the manga. So what can be disappointing about this game is the lack of battles. So many missed opportunities. It just hammers you with all of these story scenes. When there were story scenes made with the in-game graphics, it was fantastic. Those were great, but those were far and few between. Most of the story scenes were stylized still images with dialogue over them, which wouldn't be so horrible by itself, but there was just so much of them so many of them that without any that without any battles to break them up sometimes at one point in the game you go through four or five of these story missions in a row no battles just four or five separate missions of just straight up story scenes it was a little ridiculous thankful thankfully you can skip them even if it's your first time seeing them it was just kind of poor design overall i mean Where's the fight with the evil scorpion in the beginning of the the story? Or the killing machine on Dermline Island? Why isn't Crocodile a playable character? Just, you know, a few missed opportunities there. Overall, I love the action in this game. There just wasn't enough of it. Yeah, that sounds like everything else I've heard about that. Mm -hmm. I see we have a first price drop in the United States. Oh, did we? About now. Yeah, it's down to 40 on the eShop. So hopefully some fans that uh, heard all the negative reviews or middling reviews, I guess. I mean, they weren't all just horrible. But um, I heard a lot, you know, what was the uh, the tower that you could run endlessly? I know that was... The Temple of Recollection. That part was... Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I've heard that from many people. And that was the... uh, 
what was it? That was what they were doing at demo. I think at PAX West. Um, one of my friends was there trying uh, trying it, and he wrote like a really glowing review. But that's what they let the people play. That was all that was there. Yeah, they didn't get the endless story see anything else. <laughs> No, they, they did no story mode. He's like, yeah, he goes, I don't know any story about this, but my God, that was fun. He goes, I played it for like 30 minutes and got to ask a bunch of questions. And, you know, you and I talked to the producer, obviously, and he was very positive about stuff. But what what did you say recently on your uh, Tactfully Die podcast? This has sold less than 100,000 copies. Oh, more Japan. like 35,000 or something like that. It's in, I think, even for, because I know it's a very niche kind of game so they're i'm sure they weren't going for that much because yeah, those yeah. kind of anime uh games don't tr- you know don't sell a whole unless it's like dragon ball z or something they don't sell like a whole lot because i saw some mm-hmm. other games that were coming out around the same time but even those games were make were making like i don't know 50 to 100 thousand a pop depending on what they were but i'm sure sh- i can't i 35 thousand can't be their goal it must have been it had to have been more than that so I don't think it did very well for even with a, a smaller goal of what they probably had. And then, you know, paying for worldwide release. Yeah. And what was I thought yeah. was interesting, and I'm not sure why, but like the Switch version outsold the PlayStation version like by a lot. I was, I was surprised by that. But apparently yeah, a lot of people were more about playing Japan it Japan loves their portability. That's a big reason why. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it looked really it looked a lot better on the because you could get it on the PlayStation 5 and it looked, oh, my God, so fantastic on that and especially Steam because it was even on Steam, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, but it did run well on the Switch. Again, another Dragon Quest game that ran well on the Switch and didn't have the issues that, mo- that Monsters did. <laughs> Yeah, um, Dragon Quest Austin from uh, DQFM, uh, I was talking to him behind the scenes because we never got, um, I know you and I requested um, with our connections, a review code and for different platforms. And mm-hmm. for RP Gamer, we requested Switch. And I guess Austin picks up the phone and actually talks to people um, or deals with it a lot more um because he's with a website a bigger website and he's their games editor so we're he's just got more inside information and he said that uh like they just they didn't give out review codes for switch for some reason like no reason they was just like hey we're not doing switch do you want a review code for ps5 so he took the ps5 and like it you think that right away is like oh they must have only wanted people reviewing like the best copy but i've heard like nothing bad about the switch version like oh that's no it's it, it was a perfectly fine port and it was on everything it was on the xbox and playstation and steam yep. and all the different systems um and it uh and i can see why that maybe they were very hesitant about um doing a physical edition over here like a lot of people mm-hmm. bitched about that but if they weren't expecting like huge hum- humongous sales based off a lot of stuff that had been happening recently with die i can understand that they just wanted to go digital only but now i really really understand it, it, since it, it even in japan it would just not did not do very well I'm I'm excited because I'm actually get to um, semi related to this. One of the uh, voice actors that does Hadlar and Flazard and a couple of other minor characters, he's now going to be showing up at an anime con that I'm going to next week on my birthday. So I'll be able to get to meet him and my copy of Infinity Stretch that I ordered from Southeast Asia, which is in English. That's the the one way you could get it physical in English. I'll have him sign that, so it'll be fun. Nice. Can you ask him why none of the voice actors are on Cameo? Ask him, like, have you ever thought about being on Cameo? <laughs> none of you guys are on Cameo. It's a little weird. I will. I'll slip on the Slime Time <laughs> business card, and I'll be like, hey, you should be on Cameo, too. Easy revenue stream right. for voice actors, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's not exactly a AAA box office money that they're getting, so don't turn it down if it's there. Yeah, they must have down times when they could use income. I do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Like, <laughs> but by the way, eight I played, o'clock at night. Can I call people and make some money off of this? <laughs> I played Infinity Strash as well, and and so I, I have all the same feelings as Pendy. I think the that the roguelite mode, what's it called? The the Temple of Recollection. Whatever. Yeah, the Temple of Recollection. Can never recollect I, that. <laughs> for me, it gets <laughs> it gets a little <laughs> boring. Like I think it needs a little more creativity to it. Like it's just closed rooms full of different combinations of enemies, right? Like I would like some visual variety, like different looking environments or different size of environments. You know, like clearly this game was made on a very limited budget, but like people do praise that mode. But as somebody who plays a lot of roguelikes, I would say it's it's pretty limited compared to actual roguelites. Oh, it is. It is simple, simplistic for sure. Like I would say the 
the dungeon the dungeons that you randomly got in Dragon Quest Nine are, are a hell of a lot more complicated than anything that you get in Infinity Stretch for sure. Very yeah, simple know. mode. Give it a little variety, but they did the best they could with what they had. We assume. <laughs> yeah, and that's. I mean, I played a lot of games. I, I think about. Um, God. Gosh, what am I thinking of? Idea Factory. I had to think of the word bad. Bad Idea Factory. Idea Factory games are, they know their niche. They know they're selling like fifty to 70,000. Um, Neptunia game. Well, that's that's an Idea Factory game. They know what they're selling and they know their target. And uh, I think really the only Neptunia game I ever finished was a, it's called Action Unleashed You. And it was a Muso style game. And Paul, exactly what you're talking about. You're just in a room with like no visual variety and just battling a bunch of monsters. You know, they, they might have had 10 monster skins in that game and okay. different colorations of them. But when like you went to do the missions, there was no background. It was just like you're fighting them on a big piece of octagonal purple with nothing in the background. And Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, sure, there's 200 of them on the screen, but 80 of them all look like one, and 60 of them look like another, and 40 look like another, and Aww. there's no background, and there's no rocks, there's no terrain or anything. It, oh, Jesus. You know, yeah, because even the, you know, the, they know what they're going to sell, and there's shitloads of them. You look at Idea Factory, they pump out like three, four games a year, so they must know how to budget for to make that profit. So it, it from what it seems like, because I haven't played it, but from what it seems like is it looks like it was more ambitious, and then it did didn't have that budget to do it like with all those just cutscene missions that should have been fights like you said yeah, Pendy. I, I can definitely see that where mm-hmm. and it's so weird because they've had so much production time on it now granted it was delayed production time but still mm-hmm. uh, it's just there's so many missed opportunities for so many different fights that they could have done throughout the game it could because the, what you do get is very fun and very well done it's just there's not enough of it Mm-hmm. And too much story. Yeah, not something you All would right. usually say in an RPG, but when it's yeah. <laughs> presented in that particular way, come on. Yeah, you know, it's good to have story, but you got to have that balance. And yeah. so, it, whereas you know, a lot of games have it's all battling. And hey, what was it? Uh, what were you talking about, Yangus? You're all rhythm, no story. <laughs> um, <laughs> this one was uh, a lot of story. It never, never got its rhythm. Yep, it's the inverse. It's the inverse. <laughs> All right. Well, the inverse of Pendy, I believe, is Paul. So, uh, Paul, what's your uh, second game you want to talk about tonight? That's true. Pendy is the yin and I'm the yang, baby. (laughs) But I'm here to talk about an actual release that came out this year. That is Double Dragon Gaiden, Rise of the Dragons. So the Double Dragon series, for people who don't know, is a highly influential and long running beat em up series. Mm -hmm. The first Double Dragon was released in arcades in 1987. It was developed by a Japanese company called Technos that sadly is no longer with us today. In US, it was published in arcades by Taito. So sometimes people think it's a a Taito game, but it's not. It was from Technos. And anyway, it that was the game that pioneered co-op and beat 'em ups. You know, two players cooperating cooperating together in arcades and in the Sega Master System port, many other versions. So the series, you know, when Technos went out of business, eventually the license ended up with Arc System Works. They released a game called Double Dragon Four that was a modern NES style game. You know, from a skeleton crew of four developers and that game is okay but it it didn't do that well like it doesn't feel like a real nes game and it's got like a lot of issues with it you know so i like it but not everyone does and anyway the the newest double dragon then is double dragon gaiden it's lice it's published by arc system works but it was developed by uh like a gosh a developer in some asian country like a, a tiny asian developer in singapore i think so it's it's called Gaiden because it's not it's not part five. You know, it's its own thing. It's sort of a retelling of the story of the first Double Dragon, but it borrows elements from a bunch of the different games in the series. And it is let's see, this is like a twenty five or thirty dollar game. I think it's twenty five. It's on all the platforms. And basically this one, it's it's got some roguelite elements to it. It is not actually a roguelite. But it, it has some things to it. So let's see. You start a you start a new game in single player or local co-op. Does not have online play. 
And first thing you do is you set the difficulty. Like you adjust these like seven different stats, six or seven different things. So basically like how how often can you revive? You know, how much does it cost you to continue? How aggressive are the enemies, etc. You adjust these things and it basically affects how much of the overall currency, like how much currency are you going to earn during your playthrough? The easier you make it, the less you'll earn, but you'll actually be able to beat the game. Whereas if you play on normal or harder difficulties, you may not be able to beat it because it is really tough. So I like I like to just play on easy. Like I, I don't need to earn as much money in one go. But anyway, so you set your difficulty, then you select a pair of characters. Each person selects two characters because this is a tag team game. Right at first, you're selecting from Billy and Jimmy Lee, the protagonists of the series and a couple of extra characters. One guy is named Uncle Martin, and he's like a grapple-type brawler character. And the other one is Marion, the, the girlfriend from the series. And Marion is different. From, well, they're all different. Like, they all have unique special moves. So they're each one, even Billy and Jimmy are different in this one, which is cool. But Marion is particularly different because she has a gun, so she can keep enemies at a distance, you know, and she's just in trouble when they get close. So she's a really good, like, girlfriend-type character or beginner-player-type character, which is nice. But you're not limited to only those four characters because as you play through this game, you're going to earn tokens, which are the overall currency, the metagame currency, and they allow you to unlock additional characters. The unlockable characters, they're just the bosses from the game. So it's not like, gee, I wonder who you can unlock. It's, well, it's the bosses. Like you can unlock a Bobo, Lin Linda, who's normally a regular enemy, but she's a boss in this one and characters like that. But um, those characters are, are very wildly different. They can't use weapons, unlike the, the main characters who can. So, but, so you got a lot of variety from unlocking characters and choosing your tag team. Then let's talk about what it's like as a beat em up. So when this game was announced and people were reading about it, like a lot of people were complaining about the art style. Like it has kind of a, a chibi art style with big headed characters but it's still very colorful. And, and to me, it's a pleasing art style. Like some people just want this realistic art style, but like, man, you, you miss out on so many games if all you want is is realism. You know, it reminds me of when Borderlands first came out, there were people who were opposed to Borderlands because it had the cell shading thing, right? And it, it's the same kind of thing, like just being snobbish about a unique art style that's actually creative. It's not a flawed art style at all. So anyway, I think it looks good. Some people might pass on it for that reason, but. Uh, Gameplay-wise, you have one main attack button, then you've got a, a grab button, and you can use that to pick up weapons or, or do certain other kinds of moves. Then each character has three unique special moves, and these special moves cost energy that, that fills up over time, and that's what makes them all so different from each other. So it's kind of a simple... And that might sound a little bit simple. Like, normally Double Dragon has a punch and a kick button, or a left attack and a right attack button. So they simplified it where it's just that one main attack button, but they've added a lot of unique gameplay things that actually create depth. For instance, when you defeat enemies with a special move, that gives you a special KO. And the focus in this game is trying to special KO multiple enemies at once. If you knock out three or more at once with a special move, then they they drop food, which gives which heals you. So that's important because, you know, in a roguelike type game, healing is very important. But also, if your health is already full, which it will be a lot of the time, then it gives you money. And that money helps you get tokens to unlock more characters and such. So, like, you don't want to just knock people out. You want to try to get three or more enemies together and knock them out with a special KO. So, um, I mean, God, there's, there's no other game like that. You know, it just creates every little encounter is interesting because of the way you're trying to maneuver them all together and such. And sometimes there's only one or two enemies, so you're not going to be able to to get the food out of them. But you still want to try to get a special KO if you can, because they also drop more money that way. So it's got some real depth to it. But also, it's got a unique game structure. Like you're when you play through this game, you're going to play four or five total levels. The fifth one depends on a decision you make after the fourth level, whether you go to the final level or not. But the order of those four levels is up to the player, because what you're doing is you're selecting the gang that you're going to take out first. Like you have a, a gang that's in the, the dumpster area, like the, the city waste dump. Then you've got a gang that is like Egyptian themed. And then you've got a gang that's sort of like wealthy Japanese family. And then you have one that's more of a street or industrial gang. So the order that you do these levels in actually affects what the game will be like because 
basically the first the first gang you face, you'll only you'll only have like two sections of levels. You'll have like level one, one and one, two. And however, then the next gang, the second gang, you'll have three sections and you can have up to four sections of levels by facing, depending on like how far you are in the game. Like that fourth gang, you got all four sections of levels and an extra complex boss encounter. And the boss encounters, they're wild. Like you'll, there's one where you ride an elevator up fighting enemies. And then you're at the top of a, like a skyscraper or a landing platform or something like that. And you'll have to fight. I think it's machine gun Willie. It could be somebody else, but you're fighting this boss while also dealing with a helicopter that's flying by and shooting at you. And this complex boss battle, if you faced that gang in the first, second or third overall levels, you would not have encountered that battle. So there's all this replay value, just like playing the levels in different order and the different sections of levels that you get. I mean, they're they're quite interesting. So, gosh, really, really interesting level design. And plus, the levels are not just going scrolling from left to right. Like in in most beat em ups, like even Final Fight, which is one of the best beat em ups, it's almost entirely just walking from left to right on a flat plane. But in this one, they took some inspiration from the old NES Double Dragons, and the levels have more of a maze-like structure to them, some of the levels. Like where you'll you'll go up through a door and that leads you to a new area, and then that door has like that room has multiple exits. So the levels aren't just completely linear either. You know, and it's interesting just seeing different parts of them. So yeah, gosh, the level design is the best that I can recall in a modern beat-em-up. So it's got that going for it. And I talked about the graphics saying that they're, they're pretty good. They're a bit retro, but not not super retro. You know, like this is a it looks like something maybe that you could play on a Saturn or something like that. But also it has really good music. Like the music is all remixes of classic Double Dragon music, but it's all quite good. And fans of the series will get a lot out of that. So all I can say is if you like beat em ups or if you like the Double Dragon series in particular, then you should definitely pick up Double Dragon Guiding because it's one of the best. Nice. I remember dropping a lot of quarters in the Double Dragon games back in the day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> right on. I, yep, I I spent a lot of my summers from like fourth through eighth grade, um, quote unquote, working at a bowling alley. What they would do, they would have a bunch of us uh, preteens or young teens come in. And this is the day before days before there were actually automatic scoring machines. Um, and they would let us stay at the bowling alley all day. It was kind of like free babysitting for my parents. Um, they'd give us like three or four dollars. We could play pool or bowl all day long. And all they asked us to do was when camp groups came in, there'd be like two to four hours a day. Um, could we help the, the the campers bowl, teach them how to bowl and keep score for them? And they'd buy us lunch, give us money for the arcade game. So I, I kind of just hung out of the bowling alley for two and a half months every summer. And uh, almost all that money went straight in just to the arcade games. Like you give me four dollars, you might as well just give me sixteen quarters and uh, <laughs> a couple like hours fun. worth of pinball and everything. Yeah, sweet. Probably have secondhand smoke uh, cancer from that one day, but you know. <laughs> uh oh. Bowling alleys in the eighties were like casinos. They were, <laughs> if you weren't smoking, you weren't bowling right. That's how I got good at Street Fighter Two. Was uh, playing that after I was done bowling in the league, and beating up mm -hmm. all the bigger kids and getting them angry that some little punk was. Sliding too much of that bison going across the screen back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> slide, uh, do cycle slide, or, or no, do the slide, and then the and then the slide kick, and then go back, just go back and forth, and throw. <laughs> it was so it was it was so cheesy. It, it was a bunch of cheesing it, but oh well. All right, getting to somebody equally cheesy. It's Yangus. I don't know if that transition worked at all. Probably yeah, not. Well, well, it's about as good as it's gonna get. Ah, oh, that's Ooh. pretty good a pun right there. Yep. All right, so uh, my next game that I'm going to talk about is actually a collection. It's uh, the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster collection that uh, released on the Switch this year. Sweet. That's right, it's six games in one for this entry on the favorites list. Originally released uh, throughout 2021 and early 2022, uh, the Pixel Remaster collection of Final Fantasy 1 through 6 finally got a home console release on Switch and PS4 in 2023. Hooray! I opted for an imported physical copy since trying to get one from Square Enix Online Store not only became impossible, but also because after the Dragon Quest XI debacle, I wouldn't try to buy anything from there, even if I could get something for free. No, I'm still not bitter about that. No, not at all. No, no not way. at all. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, this is collection sees the first six games from the Final Fantasy series getting a graphical and musical makeover uh, using a combination of newly made sprites and reworking backgrounds and areas from previous releases. 
uh, particularly for Final Fantasies 1, 2, 4, and 5, to recreate or to create a cohesive look for each game. Uh, the UI elements and controls are identical across each game, uh, with some exceptions like the turn skip button in 4 through 6, since they have the ATB feature for their uh, combat. Uh, and there's also new features such as mini maps and a treasure chest counter that uh, help make it easier for players who either get lost or, you know, they're unsure of how much. Uh, what, how many treasures they need to get in an area or what they might have missed or what they need to go to next as well. So helpful to have that. Uh, new to this console release in particular are some boost options that allow players to uh, set the amount of EXP, Gill, ability points, and so on uh, throughout each game, depending on which game you're playing. Uh, I really like this per this inclusion uh, in particular as it means on replays you can set your EXP lower, for instance, to give yourself a little more of a challenge. Uh, you can turn up the amount of ability points you can get in uh, Final Fantasy V to make some of the job class grinding a little faster, particularly for the later stages of some of the some of the job classes where you have to get like 700 points to master it and stuff like that. Or in, uh, in a Final Fantasy II's case, it makes uh, making it a little easier to strengthen spells or uh, weapon types that you get later in the game, especially if you want to give them a try. We don't want to spend too long grinding on them. Uh, you can also freely toggle enemy encounters on and off, uh, excluding uh, force battles and bosses and you can select the new arrangement music, or you can also use uh, the original soundtracks uh, when playing each game. Uh, I'm not going to do, I, you know, I won't do a full breakdown of each single ti of every single title since we've already done that way back when we started Side Quest. So, you know, go back to episode one if you want to hear some more in-depth stuff from me and everybody else that was on that episode. But um, I will talk about a few things that I enjoyed uh, with these Pixel remasters that, you know, just kind of stood out to me. So first off, you know, I love the new customization options, which I think was a great inclusion, especially if you're a longtime, you know, fan or you're looking to replay the games with a little bit of a difference to it. And I love that they, um, you know, that they had each, each game had its own version of the boost as well. So like Final Fantasy twos has a lot of stuff for them for that. You can do it so you can set it so you're um, learning a higher rate for the weapons if you want. Or you can set a little lower. Uh, like with Final Fantasy VI, you can turn it so when you eventually can start learning magic for characters, you can set the points up for that a little higher if you want to try and make some of the ones that are, uh, are a little harder to grind out, like the with the times one multiplier, you make it a little faster, like for stuff like Gravaga and Tornado off of uh, the Midgar Zomer uh, Magisite. Uh, but anyway... Uh, I really like getting to finally play a version of a 2D version of Final Fantasy III. That was a personal big highlight for me. And I liked that with that particular entry that they included changes to the game's job class system based on some of the stuff that they did with the 3D, meme, 3D remake of the game back on the DS and PSP. Uh, namely improving some job classes that originally struggled, like the Bard, for instance. Now, instead of it being where you have to have a certain harp equipped, the Bard will now learn specific songs when it reaches certain job levels. So, by default, they start off with their healing one, they get to job level 10, they get the song that boosts attack power, get to job level 20, they get the song that boosts defense, and so on and so forth. Uh, I also really loved a lot of the new visual details they included in specific dungeons and locations, uh, such as the blowing sand and dirt in abandoned castles and areas in Final Fantasy II, uh, the glowing lights and the ominous objects that you can find throughout the Tower of Babel in Final Fantasy IV, uh, the water effects throughout the entire collection. A lot of little details like these, you know, help make each area pop out and stand out in a really cool new way, and it was fun finding them and uh, trying to look for new little changes here and there, because some of them are subtle, but when you notice them, you're like, oh, that's a really cool little detail. There's still stuff like that adds a lot. Uh, I really like that there was also access to a full world map and uh, dungeon locations, uh, particularly so you can keep track of monsters for the beast area, which was super nice. Uh, definitely made completing each monster list uh, for each game much easier. And um, each game does a really nice job with its beast series while giving a lot more details for each enemy. And it felt more in-depth than a lot of previous releases uh, and how they handled their own bestiaries, because you know sometimes you need to you if you're replaying one of the games, you're like oh, I need to figure this out, or you you uh, do have to keep like digging online to try and find stuff you don't want to. Um, now, admittedly, I was you know disappointed that some of the new content from uh, previous editions aren't present, uh, namely for like Final Fantasy IV, where we didn't have the Cave of Trials or the ability to swap out for some of the previous party members. Uh, but I do appreciate that uh, with these 
uh, pixel remasters that you can save your completed game data once the credits roll. So, you know, it makes it even more progress that you've done, uh, especially in like the first three games, which have long stretches without, you know, manual save points, uh, made it so you didn't lose any of your levels, like, especially like for Final Fantasy III, which, you know, is infamous for having the incredibly long Crystal Tower dungeon followed by the Dark World dungeon before you fight the final boss. And there's no hard save points in between. There is quick saving, and the game usually is pretty good about auto saving, but it's still nice that the game does the you know you beat the game you know you can save your clear data i I appreciate that um of the games through i would say final fantasy 3 and final fantasy 6 felt like they had the most effort put into them not that the others didn't but i think it comes down to that final fantasy 3 you know it's never had a full 2d remake before it's only had the 3d remake from the ds and psp and that was like 20 something years after it originally came out so it hadn't had a 2d remake until now and Final Fantasy VI uh, felt like it had a lot of extra production value uh, put into it for the remaster with a lot of new details and a lot of like the original backgrounds getting touched up and uh, tweaked a lot, especially in the battle scenes when you'd get into fights. Uh, all the games looked and played really well, but those two in particular just stood out to me and felt like that they developers wanted to really push the envelope for them since uh, Final Fantasy VI is such a fan favorite and Final Fantasy III never got a 2D remake before until now. Um, but speaking of Final Fantasy VI, I really, I really appreciate that they made it so much easier to find one of the bosses in the game uh, in the World of Ruin portion of it. Uh, it's the boss Death Gaze. So in the original, he was just in random locations, and you would have to fly around. You'd have no idea where he was. You just had to hope that you would just randomly fly into him, find his spawn location. Hopefully, you can beat him. If not, he flees. But you know, keeps the damage you did to him. But you, then you got to go fly around trying to get him again. In the Pixel Remaster version, thankfully, he now moves between set locations, just like he originally would have. But now it's much easier to find him because it will be indicated by this dark sphere that will appear on the world map, usually in ocean areas. So it's so much easier to try and find him and track him down. Uh, all you got to do is you find the sphere, you touch it, you get into a fight with him. And let me tell you, it makes avoiding him in the World of Ruin so much easier, too. Uh, especially when you first get the Falcon and you're just like flying around. Because I had that happen where I got into a fight with him like the first time playing the game. And it just he totally owned me or owned me when I got flying because I just was messing around with the airship that you just got. Totally killed the party. Had to redo quite a bit of stuff. <laughs> so I appreciate that they made it much easier to keep track of him, uh, both for people who are trying to avoid him and people that are actually trying to defeat him. Uh, also, shout out to the whole opera scene in Final Fantasy VI. They went above and beyond uh, with that, uh, giving a lot of really cool details to it, giving, a two, giving it an HD 2D kind of look uh, for all the performances. And it's crazy, too, that each of the song, that each of the game's uh, language options, it has its own set of singers for each language. It's crazy. You got Japanese, you got English, you got Spanish, you have the Russian. Wow. I would like I saw that on the iTunes release of the soundtrack and I'm like wow they went above and beyond and sure enough like brewery and told me about this one too you can go onto youtube and you can find the clips where like so that way you know you don't want to try and mess with the doing it in game you can watch clips where they have all the different audio um singers sing you know synced up with the in-game portion and from listening to them uh by themselves it's really cool that they did that and even watching the credits like it's different it's like native speakers from each of those countries that the languages are based on so that was really cool um, but speaking of the music, I also really loved the newly arranged music throughout the games. Um, been listening to them a lot on iTunes since their release uh, early last year or so. But getting to hear them in game was so was so nice. It was so cool. Uh, really gave me uh, some sense of scope with moments like uh, and a new sense of scope with like um, the final encounter of Final Fantasy IV, for instance, when uh, all the characters not in your party are sending their hopes and prayers to uh, Cecil and company on the moon. Or in Final Fantasy V, when the Dawn Warriors kicks in, when uh, Gallif goes to save Barts and company from x Death Castle. A lot of cool moments like that I really enjoyed. Uh, overall, though, I really enjoyed playing through each and every game in this collection. Uh, it was a lot of fun re-experiencing each game, especially for some that I hadn't played replayed in a long time. Uh, in particular, I really enjoyed my time with Final Fantasy 2, 3, and 5 from this uh, Pixel Remaster collection. About the only one I was kind of meh on was Final Fantasy 4, but I'm also a real big fanboy of that game. And it's also one that I've played the other 2D renditions and all of their content. So admittedly, 
I would prefer playing like the PSP version, but I still enjoyed the Pixel Remaster version. So a lot of really cool stuff to it. Uh, this is a collection that I say is well worth grabbing. You know, if you enjoy these games or you're looking to play the early games of the series, uh, you can get the games individually on digital shops if you know you only want to play a certain one. But I'm a crazy man who wanted them all, and I bought this collection as a birthday gift for myself this year. So by golly, that's what I got. <laughs> uh, I was shocked that I managed to actually get through all of them before the end of the year uh too since i really didn't rush through any of these titles and when i was playing through one of them i was on vacation so i was like well my time's pretty much taken over by that so i just played like maybe 30 or 40 minutes in the evening hours <laughs> but um now I, I, this is just a real rough estimate but i think i got roughly about 180 hours combined across the games from playing them so this is definitely a collection you can easily get your money's worth out of if you go with the physical rendition or if there's a certain one you want to get then hey you know what I don't know how much if they've ever really been on sale, but, you know, I I as someone who really enjoys the earlier Final Fantasy games, like I was kind of on the fence at first, these Pixel remasters. But when they got their console releases and hearing some of the details and people talking about them, it's like, you know what? This is finally worth getting them. And even though we had to wait a, quite a while for the console releases, it's well worth getting whether you play it on your Switch or your PS4 or if you decide to get it on Steam or something like, hey, there's different options and different ways to play it so if you got a particular game from the first six final fantasies are you looking to try them out for the first time uh you can't go wrong in my opinion yeah right. i was playing these uh i was playing these as they were coming out on mobile and i bought one four five and six i beat one all the way and then i've started five a little bit so far and i was just glad more than anything else to see a remake of five and six that didn't look like dog shit <laughs> <laughs> as the previous ones did where they looked like smoothed over characters that looked like a kindergartner rendered them or something i don't know but these new ones look fantastic the way they they redid the the pixels uh for all of these games yeah it looks really good uh, i agree with you angus that the the music for this the the remixes for the music are fantastic that that has been a lot of fun listening to those as i've been going through some of the games and yeah, it's a fantastic collection and a very good remake of, of each and one of each each of these games. They just all look good. Hey, I do have a question for you though. Does it still have the the crappy font that were that they had in the in the mobile games, or did they have any other font options or remake that at all? Or by default, they have the more fancy looking font, but you can also change it to classic font, which oh. I did immediately for every single game. So. Yeah, don't blame me. <laughs> Because <laughs> that that default font is just it's it pains my eyes, but I'm glad that they have that option now that we can do the, the classic font. Because that, mm. that. <laughs> but otherwise, but beyond that little complaint, like all the of what I played of the Pixel Remasters, they've been absolutely wonderful. What a it's it's nice to see the Final Fantasy Final Fantasy games like this get you know some really good love and tender care that sometimes they didn't always get when they did remakes or ports like for like some of the earlier PlayStation ports and stuff like that it's like oh we'll just throw in a few movies and have fun with the loading times and things like that so it was really good nice yeah i, I actually have that on a list uh, it's on my deku deals list if there's ever a decent discount on that cuz like you said it, it's kind of new this year to switch although they've been out for a while um I wouldn't mind replaying all six of those. I've played them all at various times. I uh, did two on the Game Boy Advance, I think, back in the day, and I really like three on the DS. Yeah, three was three is definitely one that stood out to me. It's it was a lot of fun replaying that one in this collection, and it it mm -hmm. it's a pixel remaster. Like they they really like I was saying before, like it feels like that they really went above and beyond trying to give that game. Um, the high quality 2D treatment, you know. Yes, very much so. Especially since it never originally got. So, like the the story is, is that it was gonna have a Wonder Swan port back in the day, like uh, how Final Fantasy one, two, and four did. But something fell through. Um, it never ended up coming out for whatever reason. So I feel like this is kind of like them being like, "All right, you know what? We weren't able to do it before. We're gonna go all out and do it again. We're gonna we're gonna do it right this time." Damn it! <laughs> nice. Yeah, and what, and what I saw is that they brought in the original designer for these graphics to do the actual remasters, the pixel remasters. Yeah, um, I, bu I bought a book uh, about that, and it's it's been fantastic. The the way what they've been able to do with that to bring in that original person that's been great. Really did it justice. 
All right. Well, I will uh, go on to my second game. This was a game that came out uh, kind of towards the end of last year. I'm going to talk about Harvest Stella. And it was a game that uh, kind of, again, I was dying to review for RP Gamer. And then the review date of it, and I think um, much like I, we've been talking about Dragon Quest, the Square Enix reviews haven't been coming out before the game. Um, but like I think we got a review code for that after it came out. And by then it was like, oh my god, Dragon Quest Treasures is not far off because this came out November of last year. And it was right before Treasures. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll wait for Treasures and review that, which I did. Um, uh, but finally got around to um, playing this because I made my promise this year to myself. My uh, gaming goal that I put on the den was I was not going to pay full price for any video game outside of Dragon Quest anymore. Like, I've got a backlog of 50, 60 games easily, probably stretches into the hundred. Um, but like probably 30 or 40 of these, I really, really, really do want to play. And I don't I don't need to buy $60 games. There's tons of them out there that go with. 50, 60, 70, 80% off. Um, gosh, I was buying the, the South Park games this year and some of the uh, Muso games with the, uh, what's that pirate themed anime? One Piece. I'm buying a couple of those at like 80, 90% off and just having a ball with those. And I'm like, all right, like 50% off or more for full games or, it, it, you know, for the games that are $30, cool. Let me just get a little discount on it and they'll be fine. So this summer, finally on Amazon UK. It popped up that Harvest Cell was 30 bucks. I bought it and holy crap, like I think that's pretty much all I played June and July um, was this game. I put like 70, 80 hours into it. Uh, I love Rune Factory. That is one of my top three series ever. And this is Square Enix's attempt to make a Rune Factory game. They were like, oh, you can do harvest or you can do farming with a battle system. We can do farming and battle system and make it look like a freaking Final Fantasy 13 or something like that. Um, not that I've ever played Final Fantasy 13, but I think like graphics wise, that's where it might have fallen. It's not the highest res graphics, but it's beautiful, like the landscapes and everywhere you go. There's these huge crystals in the background. Um <laughs> that are just kind of part of the whole game these seas lights um they're called and they're just always in the background and they're always just shining and glowing and just the locales that you go to are just amazing um again you know it's switch graphics it's i didn't play this on anything that pushed the limits but it, it worked it didn't chug they did a good job um it was optimized for the platform <clears throat> And it was great. Um, the protagonist and a lot of supporting people I thought was interesting. They were all female right off the bat. Although I think you could pick a guy at the beginning, but he looked pretty much like a female. Like it, it was very, th there was very subtle changes. I think like the hair got longer and maybe the thighs got a little wider or something. But it was like, it was very like, oh, that doesn't really um, change anything much. And I mean, it wasn't important to the game anyway. Um, but basically, yeah, it's you're farming and you're making friends with people. But there's a big focus on this one of a huge overall narrative, because basically you don't know who you are. Hey, stop me if you've heard this. You're an amnesiac that uh, kind of woke up. You're in this area in a place and it's undergoing what's called the quietus. The quietus is a couple days between seasons where nobody goes outside. There's like this powder fills the air and everything dies in between seasons, at least in your garden. Nothing will survive in between the seasons. Quietus kills it all. And it's harmful for people to get out there. And your very first friend you make is the doctor in town that's trying to cure um, people who've been affected by the quietus. And I think every town you make about two friends in and there's four or five towns. There ends up being like 10, maybe 12 playable characters. Um, all these playable characters also help you open job classes. So there's job classes that open along the way and there's more in the post game. But you're going basically town to town, making meeting people and at the same time farming to earn cr money from selling your crops. But basically everything that you need in the game healing wise um, is made at, at your farm. Um, and my gosh, there's really I, I, I never found out a good way to really super optimize my farm. It's a lot simpler than Stardew Valley or any of the Rune Factory games. Uh, they strip down the farming to like, here's a plot plop. You put down seeds um, as long as you water it, it grows. There's not 
not a lot of stuff that you can do. You can kind of later on grow stuff, but things grow pretty slowly. And the plots that you plop down stuff on are pretty big. There's not they take a lot of screen space. Um, you're not going to be growing hundreds and hundreds of crops. You may be growing a couple dozen, maybe a dozen to begin and your farm can get bigger. You can pay somebody to expand your farm. A lot of the food needs to be processed and you need to build things on your farm to process it. If you want orange juice, you need to build a juicing machine and it's not instant. Like you put the oranges in there and it takes um, a couple hours or a day in game to get that orange juice out. So I felt like everything was very slow and on purpose for that, um, which was good because honestly, uh, farming was okay. It was decent. It was the story of this game and the individual stories that just really, really did an amazing job. And you could ignore a lot of the individual stories because these two people in the five towns, it built up because each of them had, um, I think it was 10 stars of friendship that you could get with each. So um, in addition to other side quests around the towns, uh, there was at least 10 side quests per people. So that's like 120 side quests. And they're not really all that short. It wasn't just, hey, get me this one item. It was a lot of times, hey, go here um, in the afternoon, get this, bring me, do this. Um, it was involved, but I found myself, I think near the end, I kind of burnt out and maybe left one or two side quests with a couple of the last people. But I, gosh, the first eight people I encountered, I went all the way through their side quest, made sure I did it 100%. And uh, I know I thought after doing the treasures, game like nobody in our rp gamer picked it up for quite a while um finally our editor-in-chief picked it up alex and i was like oh i, I felt a little bad because i'm like oh he's not a he doesn't really enjoy farming sims he's not a casual gamer um but he loved it gave it a four out of five like really praised it and then kind of unprompted i noticed uh where did he uh he went back like a year ago uh, or a year later, like at the beginning of November, I was just going through doing proofreading for some people on RB Gamer. And I noticed that he had posted a whole thing like he goes, it's a year ago, a year later. And he uh, wrote an article called Harvestella's Farming Sim Nature Belies Its Narrative Ambition and just went back again and just um, wanted to write a little bit of stuff unprompted, like how this game still like the narrative and the way it was broken up overall. Um, awesome narrative and then all the individual narratives were just really awesome and just came out at a busy time and not a lot of people played it and you know it was a it was something you wouldn't expect uh, Square Enix to do but they got into it and it, 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 it gosh like narratively that was it because honestly the uh, battle system was blah um, it was an action RPG like Rune Factory is and you could bring two of your as you found these people and unlocked them you could bring two people with you they were completely AI controlled um, what was supposed to be one of the biggest things was all these jobs that you get um, you can equip three at a time and just quickly hot um, switch between them in battle so you could be a mage casting spells press a button run up and just bam 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 with your sword and honestly, I it it was so you couldn't dodge worth a damn. I know it had it in there. I was not good enough to do it. It just felt like it was a slugfest at all times. And pretty early on, I unlocked a mage category. And then I think I unlocked a higher one later. And that's all I did. I just sat in the back, let my um, MP or whatever it was refill a little bit if I had to run around. Um, but I just took pot shots from the back all the time. Uh, there's another one you unlocked guns later and that was like one I could switch to and like uh, I'm just going to sit back here I'm going to let my AI controlled people go up there and slug it out and I'm just going to take pot shots from the back it, it, I barely engaged with the battle system um, beyond what it was but yeah it, this story 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 um, was just awesome and the farming was a fun way to you know go about some of the other stuff and I, I loved me a good farming game but um, gosh, it, it showed me that, you know, hey, Rune Factory, there there's there, there can be some Rune Factory likes. I know uh, in terms of 2D, you got your uh, lots of pixel based games like this. Stardew Valley created a trend, but just work on that battle system a little bit more, much like uh, what did I really like a couple years ago? I talked about on our Halloween one, um, the dungeon, not dungeon, Graveyard Keeper. Uh, that was a cool one, although the battling in there was, you know, limited, very limited. But 
I, I loved Harvest Hell. I, I feel like it took the visuals of a more modern Square Enix game and took the very anime aspect of Rune Factory and cranked it up to what maybe modern gamers would like. I don't know how this sold or anything. Um, I don't know if a lot of people that love the casual games went into this. Um, the battle system could kind of take you out of it a little bit, but um, it, it was actually easy enough. I, I don't really I don't think I ever died uh, maybe once or twice, but um, the NPCs AI were very good. Thank goodness. But don't regret paying half price. I it, And it was definitely worth full price. Sounds really cool. Yeah, I, 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 I was surprised how much I liked it. I knew I wanted to try it. I did not know that it would suck me in for 70 hours and just take over, over my summer. So speaking of taking over, Pendy and Yangus, you both have the same third game. Um, but Yangus, before you hopped on, Pendy said he read all the things you wanted to talk about, and they were surprisingly not the things he wanted to talk about. So I think you two will have a very good different discussion about your last two games. Pendy, do you want to start it off? And Yangus, you can either jump in while he's doing it or wait till he's done and then comment. Sure. However you want to do it. But go ahead, Pendy, give it a start. Okay, so, you know, as you alluded to, my last game is Super Mario RPG. You know, this remake was wonderfully done by the studio Arte Piazza, who is best known for their work on many Dragon Quest titles, including the Dragon Quest V PS2 remake, DQ4, 5, and 6 for the DS, and the 2D mode for Dragon Quest XI. I've really been looking forward to playing this game, especially in this remade form. The original was a game I missed out uh, when it first came out, but I was able to play it years later in college through emulation. Though certain er errors to the difficulty of emulating games with a Super FX chip, that that was one of the games that took advantage of it. Through this game has been a total blast. It is such a great, fun to play, turn-based RPG with characters from the Mario world. I'm also all about any turn-based RPG that spies this a little bit with a little extra timing to the attacks. Super Mario RPG does this very well. It keeps it fresh by having different weapons and spells for all the characters that have different timing elements to it. The timing for Mario's Koopa Shell weapon is different from using his hammer, for example. Now, my favorite weapon so far is one of the weapons that Bowser has. It consists of just picking Mario up and chucking him at the enemy. Twice, if you get the timing right. I thought that was hilarious. My favorite setup of characters back in the day was using Pow Bowser and Peach alongside Mar Mario. Mar you know, give me a chance to play as Bowser, and I'm all for it, as I've said in previous side quests. Also, it made for a balanced team with Peach's healing. Now, the game isn't super difficult, and it has some good healing, item healing items, so now I'm running a team with Bowser and Geno instead. It's a lot of offense and a lot of fun. The little side mission bonus areas that they put in this game are great, whether it be falling down a waterfall while collecting coins, or jumping on barrels and enemies as they try to hit you, hit you as you chase the princess who is being carried away by one of the bad guys. The cool upgrade is tremendous. It's night and day from me. From looks very polished. The soundtrack for this game is one of the highlights as well, and I really appreciated that they got the same composer and remixed all the music. If you don't like it, that's okay, because you can switch the settings to play the original soundtrack. <clears throat> a new addition is the action gauge. The more often you, the more often you make well-timed attacks or defenses, the more it fills up. At first I thought it was kind of silly. Like, with only two characters in the early game, when you activate it, Toad comes out and you get some kind of random status buff. I didn't think it was worth it because it wasted a player's turn to do it, and I didn't really think the buffs, were, for the most part, were worth it. But later on, when you get three characters in your party, it becomes a special triple move, combining all three characters with its own little movie scene. This is new to the remake. You didn't have the system in, in the, uh, the old game, in the original. I love these a lot. They can be powerful heals or attacks, and they are a lot of fun to pull off. Each combination of characters has its own triple move, too, which is great. So they all, no matter what combination you put in, they get a different move from it. From it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, the original game was this perfect combination of Square and Nintendo coming together to make this classic. You can tell the remake was done with a lot of love and care. I appreciated the fun and goofy storytelling and the fun and inventive battles, the creative bonus areas, and the great boss fights that this game has. It's a great addition to anyone's RPG library. Yeah, I guess I know you have this in your library. Ha 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 ha, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
Well, let's see. So, yeah, uh, so the remake uh, came out towards the end of November of this year. Uh, it's kind of a surprise reveal, too, during the Summer Nintendo Direct when it was um, teased. I yeah. think that was in June, I think. I, I remember it was in the summertime. But, uh, yeah, so like Penny was talking about, this game is a full remake of the SNES original, uh, using a lot of modern technology to recreate the game, uh, down to replicating the presentation style of the original Um Tip, you know, I mean, pretty typical for remakes, but the original used a uh, silicon graphic base to create the 3D objects as sprites in the game. So to see that style of uh, the original, you know, fully kind of realized with this remake is pretty cool because it really just felt like, you know, they took the original models, you know, they gave them not only like an upscale treatment, but they like recreated them to make them look brand new and fresh. So that was, you know, really cool, especially since uh, Mario series for a long time went through a very safe period where like a lot of characters were very simple by design and like they didn't really change too much off course from that original design like toads especially so seeing them actually stick with a lot of the original appearances from this game uh, for those characters is really cool and not trying to you know change all that up uh but anyway Quick little plot synopsis. Um, game starts off classic Mario fashion. Bowser kidnaps Peach. Mario goes to save her. Um, action ensues. Uh, just as he's about to get to Peach, though, and save her, a giant sword crashes through uh, Bowser's keep, sending the three of them flying and unknown to the characters at the time, shattering the Star Road, uh, the place where wishes are granted in Mario's world. Mario sets off to find the missing princess and eventually to recover all of the scattered star pieces. Uh, he's joined by new characters, Malo and Gino. And as uh, Penny was talking about before, it's the first time he was joined. Uh, or he teams up with Bowser and you yeah. also get a team up with Princess Peach later on. Uh, the game um, has you travel around the world uh, with all of these new locations, interacting with a number of uh, characters that originally that like original characters created for this entry, uh, such as Frog Fuchsius, the Frog Sage, uh, Booster the Seventh, and his little snifter snifster sidekicks, uh, the Dread Pirate of the Sea, Jonathan Johnny Jones, and uh, the enemy group of the game, the Smithy Gang, all of which are based off of different weapons and have uh, different punny names based on said weapons, like you have Bowyer Spiridovich. The Axem Rangers, which are a lovely play on uh, the Power Rangers. <laughs> but uh, as you travel around, uh, you do some platforming, you know, in Mario fashion, uh, discover a hidden treasure chest, uh, and you battle a wide variety of monsters from classics like the Goomba and Koopas to visitors to a uh, visitor from a fantasy who finally entered Mario's world. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so. Uh, Penny kind of talked about the combat before, you know, turn-based action commands. You know, the closer you get to the timing, the more damage you'll do. And if you also get the button timing pressed at just the right moments when an enemy is going to hit you, um, it, you can either block most of the damage or you can fully block the damage. The game's also, in the, in the remake's case, it's good about letting the player know, like, hey, these are certain skills that you cannot block. A little thing will pop up on the top right of the screen. Usually it's party wide stuff that you can't block on like certain magical attacks. So, you know, the game's usually pretty clear about that. And if you're a player that has trouble, you know, hitting the timing just right for the attacks or for the blocks, uh, the game will have a little prompt that'll pop up to um, when an attack, like when you should try and put it like it pops up like a little red exclamation point for like, hey, this is when you should hit the button for the attacker. This is when you should hit it for defense if you're having some trouble. So it's nice, too, that the game kind of keeps track of that if players are having issues or not. But, um, yeah, each of the playable characters, they all have their own special skills and kind of fall into different archetypes, uh, such as Bowser, m mainly being like your physical tank kind of character. But he has access to stuff like fear and poison, which are actually really effective on some enemies that can be a little more tricky. Uh, Peach is like your white mage, so she can heal the party. Uh, she can restore somebody if they get knocked out. And she can do a few other support things. Uh, Malo is more of your uh, black mage character, which... I never even noticed this detail until somebody just pointed out uh, back when the remake came out. He actually has the same kind of uh, puffy striped pants that Black Mages wear in the Final Fantasy series. Oh, he does, doesn't he? Because he has VV style pants. Yes, <laughs> so he does. Like, so I'm That's pointing hilarious. that out. I'm like, oh my god, he does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so he's more of your black mage kind of character and then you have gino who um he's kind of like he starts off a little on the weaker side but as you keep going he just keeps getting stronger and stronger and gets like some of the best like multi-hitting att or uh, aoe attacks in the game and he can mm -hmm. also learn ability pretty early on that will uh boost your attack and defense if you can get the timing just right so everybody has their own kind of uh roles to play and it's it's fun mi mixing around all the different characters as you play uh but 
as Penny also mentioned before, you know, new to the combat, we have the splash damage where if you hit the timing uh, just right with the attacks, uh, you will do with your uh, regular physical attacks, excuse me. Um, the physical attack will have a bit of splash damage and hit all of the enemies that are in the battle. That's right. Um, it's, that's actually kind of nice too, because like if you're someone like if you like you get the time right, it's like hey, it's kind of a little reward for you. The game's not really too difficult, but it's still kind of fun to see that where like you'll do an attack just right and all the enemies are like oh, they all do like their reaction hits. It's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, it, you can also change up your, what, what I really like too, is that in combat with this remake, they made it. So now you can change your active party, um, w- when you're in combat. So like, um, you can change it between your active and your reserves. I mean, so yeah. like, for instance, if you get into a fight where you get enemies that are not really that, um, weak against physical attacks, but they take a lot of damage from, uh, magical ones, but you don't have Molo in your party. You could like, when it gets to Gino or Bowser's turn, you could push the, I believe it's either the minus or the plus button, and it'll let you swap out for uh, Mala or Peach or you know whoever's in reserve, which is, is really cool. I really appreciate that. Plus, yeah, that can do that in the original, and it helped, and it helps to prevent you getting stuck in certain uh, situations, like if a bad party set up or something. So it's good too for Peach because you can get her in and help heal up everybody, and then get her out of dodge if you need to. <laughs> mm. But um, it's nice too if you're trying to go for a certain like team up attack but you don't have that current party as like your main one. You can swap in the person you need and, uh, you know, take advantage of that, which was good for, um, cases like where, like, like one of my favorites to use was, uh, Molo, Bowser and Mario's where they fire off like all the different element, elemental attacks and finish it off of just like this big explosion, which was great for hitting weaknesses on certain enemies. It was a lot of fun, but, um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, before you go on, before you go on, I, I also like in battle, how if you time your attack perfectly, sometimes the enemy will throw you back a bonus. Like it'll be H- HP to max or defense up, or you even get to do like a second attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's nice too. When you can, uh, when those little pop up, you're just like, all right, let's go. We got, yeah. we got a little bonus here. Um, but uh, outside of combat, uh, new additions uh, include a progress journal where the party gives their own takes and on events. Uh, mostly it's Molo and Gino, but it's kind of fun seeing what they have to say about certain things that happened. Uh, you get a full bestiary with enemy details and any of the um, psycho or well, I guess it's called now uh, thought thought peaks. I was I call I want to call it the psychopath because that's what it used to be called back <laughs> on the SNES version. But uh, yeah, you get to see the little enemy thoughts if you if you got all those. And uh, once you beat the game, there's some new challenges that are available to the player uh, to tackle and some new items to discover for a final brawl to end them all. It's like something straight out of a fantasy, isn't that weird? <laughs> But uh, jokes aside, though, uh, the new uh, boss rematches, they're a lot of fun. And the brand new super boss you can fight after you know tackling all the other new content, that, that was great. I absolutely loved it. It was a real treat and surprise, too. Um, funny story about that, I actually, you know, I managed to beat it on my very first attempt. But I was only down to Gino being my only character who was alive in the party. I'm frankly so shocked I managed to win that at all. Since the post-game bosses don't screw around, especially that new super boss. I, <laughs> I saved the footage just so I had the proof, too, and be like, yo, man, <laughs> I did. I Because that, oh, my God, that super boss. I don't know if you fought the new super boss, P- Pendy, but holy shit, he is, does not pull his punches. It's so much fun, but it is so difficult. <laughs> Oh yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet, but I've read about it. Oh That's, man, what what it's, level what levels were you at when you did that? Remember? I was at max level for everybody except oh. for two characters, but I've heard people say they've beaten him lower. But it, I mean, you probably can, but I. <laughs> I'll just say that from being down to only one character, I with Gino, I learned how to time the blocks for all of his attacks <laughs> and survive. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a really good, nice treat too, and uh, they have a cool twist for like I, I can't really I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to spoil anything, but, but let's just say that uh, it, it, they have a really cool twist on how they handled some of the elements of the of the remake when it comes to that part. But I'll I'll leave that to be a surprise. But um. Everything aside, though, you know, I absolutely loved the remake. I um, I replayed the original many times when it released back on the Wii Virtual Console back on, like, Labor Day 2009. I uh, had a lot of fun playing it again and again. And it was one game, one of those games that... Um, I that I really enjoyed it when I first started playing it and just loved it. And not only as a Mario fan, but just playing RPGs. And it's one of those games that I consider one of my favorite um, 
RPGs that I've ever played and one of my favorite Mario games. Uh, the remake certainly didn't disappoint, and I love that it kept the spirit and fun of the original uh, while adding some nice new quality of life changes like a much bigger inventory system and uh, some of the new content. And it's cool that they also included a bit of an easier mode, too. So if um, younger players you know, are playing this game for the first time, they can play on the, I think it's called breezy mode, so they can have you know an easier time playing it, too. Because, you know, if you're not used to RPGs, it can be a little daunting sometimes getting into these things. So, you know, it's nice that they had that for younger players or people who perhaps are not as good with, like, timing action command based RPGs like this. Uh, but I being the remake, be. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say names. I'm just saying. <laughs> I didn't say a name. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So being the remake, it, and this is one of those few times where I, I'll, I will not be, I'm not ashamed to admit it. The remake, um, Beating it brought tears to my eyes, and I do mean that literally because the ending cinematics and new arrangements for the music just totally got to me. But it made me so happy um, not only to you know get to play through this game in an all-new way, but it's it's so cool that now new generations of gamers and old farts like like us uh, you know can play the game in a brand new way uh, on the Switch. And you know, in some cases, I've seen a lot of people talk, like parents who are probably from our age group and you know, around that time who would have played this as kids, you know, talking about, oh, you know, I'm so happy I can share this with my own kids now. And, you know, they get to experience that too for the first time. And I get to play it in a brand new way. And I, th- like, this was a, just a wonderful remake. I, I was just having a blast from start to finish. And it's one of those things where, like, even though when I beat, when I beat it, like, I was just so happy to get it done and finished with, but I was also so sad that it was over so soon. <laughs> And it was just it was just such a great time playing it. I had so much fun. And um not only just because, you know, I, I you know, I love the original and I really loved what they did with the remake, but it just had so much like it was, it was such a well done game too. Like it had it had so much going for it that I really uh just stuck out to me personally with like the presentation and everything. It just felt like that this was a game like even if this wasn't a remake, like this was just a kind of a return to form for RPGs as a whole for the Mario games or the Mario series since we've had such a weird history with them with the departure of like Mario and Luigi. There hasn't been like a classic combat based one for Paper Mario since um, the Thousand Year Door, which thankfully that's getting a remake next year too, which looking forward to that. But it was it was cool to see, you know, that a Mario RPG came back and that so many people were excited and playing it and loving it and uh, seeing all the stuff that people talk about, like on Twitter and everything. So definitely a game that I just enjoyed the hell out of. I'm definitely looking forward to replaying it at some point in the future here. And definitely I would consider this like my absolute favorite game of 2023 because not only was it you know such a cool surprise, but it was handled so well, played so well, so much great things about it. And um, it was a great way to end 2023, in my opinion. Even though I was playing other stuff, this was a great game to uh, kind of wrap up part of the end of the year with. So, yeah. There we be. All righty. My other podcast I mentioned before, RPG Backtrack, um, it was started like 13 years ago um, by an old editor at RP Gamer. And when they started that podcast, episode number one was Super Mario RPG. So we're hitting episode 300 next Wednesday. Uh-huh. And for episode 300, we're going back and doing Super Mario RPG. Awesome. Well-timed with the release. Um, I think I'll be a little bit late. I've actually got this... Uh, reserved at the library i think in the next day or two maybe um it should be sent my way um and i know it's only about 12 hours so maybe i'll get halfway through before we record wednesday night because i've got a couple weeks off of work here um but yeah i plan to get it from the library and probably knock it out in a week because what is it 14 15 hours if i'm not yeah, gonna do all the bonus stuff probably yeah yeah yes. if you don't do a lot of the bonus stuff you'll be done in about 14 15 hours or so yes yeah, there, there's a long. lot of stuff to discover in this game though so it's definitely there's one you don't want to try and rush through mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah there's just well yeah i don't think i'll be finishing it before any uh podcast but yeah it's just not gonna su- rent again yeah it's just not a super long rpg um but and then that was like one of my complaints back in the day is that it was just too short because it's such a good game and you get to the end it's like oh no that's it <laughs> i want more <laughs> But yeah, it's it's a it's a tight you know fourteen fifteen hours and it's just you won't get bored at all. It's it's really good, really well made. It's one of the you know a lot of people say it's one of the best RPG RPGs for the Super Nintendo or or even of all time for a good reason. Excellent, mm-hmm. excellent. I'll have to get good at my button pressing or uh, 
<laughs> that mode that uh, Yang has talked about. Just play breezy mode. You'll be fine. It'll be a breeze. Yep. I actually, I kind of planned to, or before I get to my last game that I pivoted to, I, I planned to try to get to it. Um, I was on a cruise for a week about two weeks ago, and uh, without Wi-Fi on the cruise ship, I wasn't going to be able to play Dragon Quest Monsters um, on my Switch Lite because I'm not the primary Switch. My son is. And so I was like, oh, man, I got to bring a game. And I was thinking of uh, playing Super Mario RPG. And I would put an hour or two into it a couple weeks ago, maybe like almost two or three. Um, the original, I had it on my Vita. Um, and like I opened it up on the cruise ship the first night and I'm like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I was doing. And I got in a few battles and I'm like, oh, I've already lost all the I was doing OK with the button presses and uh, kind of spun my wheels for a couple days. And then randomly just I was like, you know, I've wanted to play another Atelier game for a while. I reviewed Atelier Lulua like about five years ago um, and really enjoyed it. And I know they're not super closely related, but back on the PS2, I played Atelier Iris Eternal Mana or something like that, which apparently was not much like the mainline Atelier games. But um, I had Atelier Esha, Esha and Logi, Alchemist of the Dust Sky Plus. And just because I was like, oh, it's not just one girl here, one anime girl. I'll, I'll play that game. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a start. And after a couple days on the cruise ship, I got absolutely hooked. And I'm like 25 hours in now uh, playing it on vacation. And just I, I haven't I've been back for like five or six days. Haven't touched Dragon Quest Monsters yet because I'm close to this finishing this. And I'm like, ah, oh, just got to push through and do it. And uh, but I have really, really fallen in love with this game in the past week um obviously there are a ton if you've ever heard of the atelier games i think there's like something like 23 mainline games at this point they're all out there they pump out one every year sometimes more than one a year um remakes galore i played the uh vita version which is or the plus version of a ps3 um version of this game so it's got whatever DLC or whatever baked in from the PS3 version. And uh, gosh, even right now, there are 9, 12, 13 games available on the Switch. And most of them are on sale uh, through January 4th. I picked up um, the first game in the newer uh, they usually come in trilogies, although they've been adding a fourth game to some old trilogies lately. But th there's just tons of them. And basically, almost in every game, you're a girl, a young anime girl who is an alchemist who combines stuff. And uh, it's all about these games are mainly focused on that. And honestly, um, the cast of this game, I was going through, I was working on my website today, and I was like trying to put more of my thoughts down because I'm like, hey, you know, invariably every other game I play, I end up talking about um, RPG Backtrack or for side quest or something. So I should take some more notes while I play these games and keep them up where I can find them easy. So my Platts Notes website, I was adding this game to it today and kind of broke it down into four parts that I want to talk about. The cast was, eh, whatever. Um, it's cool that you get to pick at the beginning whether you want to be the uh, girl Esha or the guy Logi. Um, both of them are alchemists. Uh, she... <laughs> Uh, she does what most of the ones in the series do. She just mixes stuff in a big cauldron and it pops out. Like, you want to make an apple pie? Cool. Throw some apples and uh, grains in a cauldron and it pops out. And the guy Logie in the game, like, calls us out. He's like, how the hell does that happen? Like, <laughs> that's not how things work. I come from the big city. Like, you actually have, like, a smell. Like, they finally get him a, uh, it looks like an anvil, hammer and anvil. And he does weapons and armor on that and that's his version of alchemy and she's like that's just like blacksmithing he's like well that's what alchemy is like you take modern equipment and you make stuff with it she's like ah, just throw stuff in the pot and it comes out that way um the rest of the cast whatever they're, they're, there's a bunch of little kids um or precocious young ones and i'm like meh um i do like the there's a warrior girl that's grown on me uh, her name is linka uh, funny enough, almost there's cutscenes galore in this game, and about half of it is voiced. Um, but you can fast travel to all these different places, and there's always little signs like, "Hey, there'll be a little story event here," and there's subquests and little stories going on all through. There ends up being, I think, eight. Um, no, no, not six. I mean, there may be about ten playable characters. Um, you can take six with you at any given time, and as you play with them more, their friendship level increases, and it unlocks even more little uh, kind of subquest stories and whatnot. 
but that, that, that that's that been like beside the point because i swear to god half the um stories that they're talking about it's all like oh because you're a civil surgeon you're alchemist for this little town and they're like oh i didn't fill out the paper right oh i need more money for funding oh i didn't fill out this paperwork right and oh it, it's it's <laughs> I guess if you worked for local government, maybe this would be a lot funnier, but I'm like, yeah, 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 fast forward through all this stuff. Um, what's really got me is the gameplay loop and the battle system, and my god, the alchemy. Um, the gameplay loop is, and I guess with an older Atelier games, they're all timed. You have a certain time limit. And this one, you have three months at a time to complete one main task. Um, and they're, it's on a five by five grid. You got this main task in the middle and then they instantly show you the eight little boxes around it to make the three by three grid of nine. It shows you, Hey, here's your main task. Here's eight secondary tasks. You have 120 days to do this three months, 120 days. Um, I haven't found the time limit to be a problem at all. Uh, I think I've played eight or nine different three month periods. Um, well into the third year at this point. Um, so maybe even 10 of these periods, I, half of them, I've completed the main task on day two or three. It hasn't been a problem. Um, some of them, it takes two weeks just because you have to walk to the place and complete the task somewhere. Um, I can usually knock out within 20 or 30 days, the eight, um, secondary tasks around the main one. And all of those give bonuses. It's almost like a casino. You get a bonus for every line of those you complete, um, and you can get permanent stat increases. You can get new alchemy books from them. Um, and then once those unlock, and sometimes randomly you'll hit the third level of stuff, um, the outer ring of tasks. Sometimes you'll randomly do those throughout your days. But then, you know, I usually have um, two months to do, and it unlocks those and tells you specifically, like, go beat this monster here. Make this item that has this property. Um and I've had fun with that, especially. I mean, this is where the, my time runs out. Uh, I think for only about half the time I've I completed all 25 tasks. I'm not looking to min-max this game by any means. So I do, and I've barely looked anything up. Um, I've done some stuff. I've actually been locked out of doing one or two things because I hadn't advanced my friendship level enough. Um, I think the one thing I finally looked up yesterday was, I was like, why can I not? It told me to go somewhere. I'm like, this isn't on the map. And I looked it up and I'm like, oh, you know, as you can do this guy's side story, that area will unlock. And I'm like, oh, well, that's one of the fools that I never put in my party. So I've not really been doing his side story. Oh, well, I did 24 out of 25 events this um, month. It's fine. And what's kind of nice is doing all those third level tasks don't give super high bonuses. So whereas doing the nine secondary ones, first and secondary ones, you get like permanent stat increases and everything. They don't have that for the last. It's just like, hey, by the way, if you want to be completionist here, try these next 16 tasks. So really love that system. The battle system is pretty good. Um, yeah, it's just tra traditional turn based. Um, everybody's got a few skills or spells, um, lots of area of effect stuff you got a bar at the top that shows who's going next um you can see what your area effect is going to hit from the monsters uh when walking around you see all the monsters on the screen you can whack them to get um you know start with the advantage in battle uh the way it plays out as i said you could take six people but three people are your main party three people are your backups um and they literally are like linked to the person right in front of them so Really, you're only battling with three at a time. But anytime it's somebody's turn, you can instantly switch them out and do that. And um, the way these games play, the alchemists, you make bombs, you make um, explosives and different things and healing items. That's what they, they have a limited capacity to bring some of those with them. Um, so you develop bombs and it, you can these bombs have four charges well you can use them in four battles uh, and then you can't use them until you go back to home base and then there's always story reasons why oh we got these little guys here that'll always make extras for you so when you come back they'll be replenished it's fine you don't have to remake them yourself um but just um and then those two players can use those items everybody else they're just like a regular rpg character although they uh after a while you unlock a specials gauge for them so they can build up to a special attack um what's fun is people can do follow-up attacks and getting it so that all six people can do follow-up attacks is pretty awesome uh the last one is really cinematic and a huge attack and 
uh, as I've gotten pretty good with this and leveled people up and really spent a lot of time with the alchemy, getting their weapons and stuff better to do more damage and whatnot. Like I've got more and more times where I've been able to do the chain of six in battle and that's just fun. It, it's almost like a puzzle. But my favorite part, which I like 10 out of 10 here, is the alchemy in this game. And I think um, this this is the part that's really keeping me from getting back to Dragon Quest monsters at the time, because it's basically synthesis. You're doing synthesis. And what do I love so much about Dragon Quest monsters is the synthesis. So uh, I'm inserting a synthesis game in here. And the way the alchemy works, it's... um, like a puzzle game. There are four uh, elements, earth, wind, fire, um, water, and every item has two different attributes tied to that. Like, uh, what is it? If you add an item into the pot, you might get two little earth bars that pop up. But also it might add 20 to your earth meter for the final product. Um and the order that you put these items in is very important because as you put them in, two different things are building up. One is your specials meter. Like I said, you get like these two little fire bars. And if I have two little fire bars, I can activate a skill of mine that doubles the amount of bonus the final element will get from the next item I dump in the pot. So, yeah, you got four items to put in. But depending on how you mix them and match them, and a lot of times all these recipes don't necessarily call for specific items. It's like put in an herb. And by now I'm 24 hours into the game. I've got like 18 herbs that I can choose from. So I'm like, all right, what herb is going to have the most earth power that I want to use in this next item? And then it'll say, hey, put in a crystal. And again, I've got like 23 different crystals that I've collected along the way. And it just becomes a puzzle of putting these things together. And I mean, you can just throw it in haphazardly, have the game recommend it and it puts it in and you'll get an item like you'll get a bomb. But there's these little bars that you can see on the final thing uh, on the final item screen. And if you can get your power meter up to these, it unlocks all these different um, special things about it. I can make a basic bomb cool and get the explosive power out of it. Or if I do my items right and I'm a high enough level, I can get a bomb that has adds extra fire damage and extra ice damage. And instead of um, blowing up or like I get four uses out of it, I can use it like eight times in battle um, and just on and on and on. It To me, it's like a puzzle. It, it, it's, you know, as much as any other game like you you're putting the stuff together or taking it apart and it's very easy to like just hit the b button back up like no 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 that didn't affect it the way i wanted to and you know just getting these items that are ridiculously overpowered um is quite fun so i, I think i'll stop right there because I, I don't think there's any other way to explain it i didn't understand it completely for the uh first six to seven hours and then when it clicked i think my third three-month period i was like oh that's what that does that's why i really want to pay attention to the order i'm putting it in like i could do so much better yeah i can make a sword with 30 attack or i could make that same sword that like has plus 10 defense and does an extra fire attack and builds up my special meter farther and i think you can get up to eight special effects on any one item that you're crafting or seven seven special effects four one for each of the uh, elements that you do and then at the end also you get these uh, cp crafting points or something that you can use on special effects on them so yeah i mean you can make a bomb or you can make a bomb with up to seven different added things and that challenge is just uh, i'm all about that i'll make somebody armor but by golly i'm gonna make that armor with six or seven bonuses to it and if at the i can't at the end i'm gonna duplicate that armor if I, I that's my goal with the earth element always at the end is I want to use the multiply so I don't just get one set of armor out of this I get two or even three if I can swing it well enough so I, I don't know how much uh, alchemy and synthesizing I'll be doing after this and uh, Dragon Quest Monsters is done in January but I'm, I'm loving it now so I'll end there and I know a few of us have some honorable mentions Pandy I do I have a couple so very short though uh, the, my first one is Street Fighter 6 uh, the new Street Fighter game that came out this past year has been excellent. 
I don't have much to say about it just because I haven't played a lot of it. I've mostly played just local co-op with uh, one of my one of my friends, and even just that much of it. Not co-op, been... multiplayer. A multiplayer. Thank you, thank you. Mm. See, there's my correction. There's my <laughs> correction for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, the, the local uh, multiplayer has been fantastic. Uh, maybe I'll be able to play Paul because Paul, you got this game too, right? Yeah, because it has should play it. Has crossplay with, with the Xbox and PlayStation and whatnot. So you don't yes. have to be on the same system. But uh, I've, I've explored a little bit of the lobby system, which looks fantastic. And I like all the little different bonuses that you can get. Uh, but mostly, again, I've just played just local multiplayer. I played in a tournament um, at the base that I'm at. And I've, I played with some friends. And I love the drive mode that it has where you everyone gets like a full drive mode bar at the beginning. Uh, but if you abuse it too much with the different special moves that you can do or the parries or, or the what, what have you, then um, you basically uh, are in a, in a state, a burnout state where you can easily get stunned. And so you can't you know, overdo it or you can't you know, you can't use those moves anymore. And, and, and you're plus you're invulnerable as well. So Street Fighter six, a lot of fun. Loved it. Uh, my next one is just tact Dragon Quest tact R.I.P. since it's uh, now going to have end of service the end of February. Uh, it's just been fun this past year getting uh, characters like the hero of Dragon Quest V, or I should say the protagonist of Dragon Quest V, along with the hero or heroes of Dragon Quest V. Uh, more die characters, such as martial artist Ma'am, who I'm such a fan of, so that's been a lot of fun. Jinx Jade. And uh, just like with uh, the Dragon Quest uh, Theat Rhythm, uh, they also added TNT boards to this game as well, and those have been a lot of fun. Uh, you get to go through the regular TNT boards, and the challenge is that once you get into a battle, you get your whole library of monsters that you can use to fight with, but once you use one once, then you can't use it for the rest of the board. So you have to be kind of strategic about it, because sometimes you'll have easy fights, sometimes you'll have harder fights. It's random how hard they can be, but once you get into like the bonus levels, then it can become a little more difficult overall and they have little boss fights and things like that so it's been a lot of fun doing that so tact has been fun this past year as well definitely paul you got any honorable mentions uh let's see honorable mentions dave the diver which i was playing the heck out of right when it came out but it's it's been a little while so i don't feel like i could talk about it for 10 minutes but it's a, a really good game. You know, it's like a, a roguelike with a big story component to it. Like, it's weird. It's like it's divided up into these chapters. And basically, you're a, a diver guy who's helping out with a sushi restaurant. And you uh, you like dive into this ocean or this bay that is different every time you go in. So that's the roguelike part. It's randomized. And uh, you just like it's real tranquil, you know, you're swimming around and, and spearing fish and collecting them. You can only carry a certain amount until you have to go back and advance time, which will, you know, advance the story and things like that. So you have to think about, like, what kind of things do you want to collect right now? So there's the diving part, which is really, really fun. And then there's also the sushi restaurant part, which is not as fun, but it's still a good component. And basically, it's sort of a time management game. Like you you pick what dishes you are going to offer at all. And then the the night starts and people come in and you have to serve them. And, and uh, you know, they'll they'll get fed up and leave if you don't serve them quickly enough. It's quite challenging. But as you get farther in, then you can hire people to help you and things like that, which makes it easier. So you have those two main gameplay elements. And then there's an intriguing story going on as well. You know, like there's a some kind of mysterious underwater civilization, you know, kind of an Atlantis type thing that you learn more about as things go on. And there's NPCs who will who will approach you like before right before your dive at certain points and they'll make requests of you. And so then you have to do their missions and doing those missions is how you advance the story. And it's it's just super good. Like uh, Dave the Diver, it's only on Steam and Switch. It's great on Steam Deck. But like if you have one of those platforms and you could enjoy an, a creative indie game, then then you should get it because it's just there's nothing else quite like it. And it is just really, really good and fun. Nice. So that's my honorable mention. All right, Yangus. Uh, yes. Yeah, so for my honorable mentions, um, first one is Suica Game, which is uh, like three bucks on the eShop. And I think it's on other stuff, too. Uh, basically, it's a puzzle game where you match up fruit, you make the fruit into bigger fruit. 
Uh, you want to get the, <laughs> the the coveted watermelon? You get the watermelon. Hey, guess what? Uh, you, you, you did good. You got plot points. Uh, pretty simple to play and understand puzzle game, but it's very addictive. Uh, it's good just to kind of turn on to play as like a relaxing sort of game. And I love the the silly art style it has with all the fruits having different little cartoon faces. Like, I love how the little tangerines have, like, a shocked face. So, like, oh, my God, don't turn me into an orange, please. <laughs> but, um, and, and it's when certain holidays have rolled around, too, they've had little updates to give you, like, a, a theme for that one. So, like, right now there's, like, a Christmas one that you could use. Uh, and they had a Halloween one back in October, which... Um, was funny because it actually switched switch or swapped out the watermelon for a uh, pumpkin with like you know classic jack o' lantern face and uh, all the fruits had like panic looks on their faces like they were scared being in a graveyard and all, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah so it's it's one that's pretty cheap um, and it's it's well worth picking up if you're just looking for like a fun little puzzle game to play uh, when you got to kill some time. Uh, other game I'll just quickly mention uh, we discussed this one in part one of this uh, two parter. But uh, Vampire Survivors, um, oh yeah, got this one back in the summer. Uh, it's very, very addictive game. It's a roguelike type of game where you have to try and survive for as long as you can, uh, up to thirty minutes. If you can get to that point, the Red Reaper will come out, and if you can somehow beat the Red Reaper, you're going to die anyway because then the Cloaked Reaper comes out and he just kills you in one touch. There's nothing you can do about that. But uh, <laughs> you can choose from a variety of characters and upgrades. You know, see how you can do in the various levels. Each of them having their own kind of enemy and challenges and stuff uh some of them being more like focused about gathering money others being more about getting equipment uh getting levels quickly and all that kind of stuff so a lot of different ways to play uh very easy to understand too as you uh, pick it up and play tons of secrets to unlock like a bunch of characters and things it's crazy how much stuff this game has to unlock and at the price is only five bucks for it so it's really not that uh, high of a price for a game that you can get plenty of time out of like i think i have about 50 hours or so according to my switch anyway it's been a good game kind of like sweep a game to just kind of plug it like put on and play when i'm listening to something or if i just need to kill some time for a little bit at work or whatever uh when i'm on my lunch break or whatever but um there's also dlc for the game that adds a lot of new content as well uh like characters maps stuff like that and i'm pretty sure that so far all the dlc has been two dollars i know there's a new one where they have like a crossover with among us i don't know how much that one is but i've heard a lot 250. of 250 it's 250 for that one okay yeah so yeah it's 50 cents more but yeah it's, it's you know you get quite a bit for your money's worth and like oh, yeah. i still have a lot of stuff that i can unlock and do but it's just fun to like replay levels with other characters and Get those, mark those little check mark, uh, check mark boxes off, and be like, "Hey, you beat the level with this character. Good job." But uh, yeah, it's well worth grabbing if you enjoy um, bullet hell type of games, or if you enjoy arcade type of games where you know it's just the simple, you know, see how long you can survive to uh, get a high score at the end, or if you if you're someone that just likes a uh, just a fun little action game where you can just kind of run around and see how crazy you can make your character as you destroy all these endless waves of the undead and monsters and uh, in some cases living trees and mushrooms that just kind of dance in place and don't bother you at all. But you got to kill them because they got that, that those precious EXP crystals and money. You got to take them out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot of fun and uh, like Suica games, pretty cheap. So, hey, if you even get just get the base game for the five bucks or whatever, or if it's ever on sale, then, hey, you're going to get plenty of uh time from your money's worth if you enjoy just a little quick something to pick up every now and then oh yeah and they added four player local co-op this year too which as a free update so that was really nice oh that's right i forgot that they did that so yeah if you got some buddies to play with on our buddies to play with locally then hey give them a chance and be like hey let's play this game for a little bit see what they think see how they do <laughs> yeah and the gameplay is so simple you could play with somebody who doesn't really know how to play video games like they just have to walk around you know like they don't have to worry about buttons so that's a good thing. Yeah, about the only button you got to worry about is uh, whenever you level up and you got to just push the A button and use the control stick to choose what upgrade you want. Exactly. That's really, that's really about it for the controls for it, too, which it makes it one of those games where it's simple to play but hard to master because, boy, there are some there are going to be some tricky uh, enemies. And like if you get the wrong kind of loadout, whether you choose to or you choose it yourself or you, know, you just pick up upgrades for the first time on maps, then oh, boy. <laughs> there's some there's some challenge there's some challenge but it's it's a lot of fun yeah it's one of my very favorite games excellent choice and vampire survivors actually started its own genre like i mean it's a it is also a roguelite but like there there's a bunch of clones now you know all kinds of different ones even first person shooter clones semi clones of it you know and there's mm -hmm. adult clones of it like there's all kinds of different versions but they're all copying this game's formula because it is so really great mm-hmm 
Yeah, and it's one of those things too when you uh like when I first heard about it and was watching stuff, I'm like, okay, well this doesn't really seem like it's anything too special. But then when you start playing it for yourself, you're like, oh, this is actually really fun because it's it's cool to see what all you can do with your characters and upgrade and everything. Definitely. And, uh, and uh, what is it? The guy who was like, I think that's the man who's the director or the person, excuse me, who's the director of this game used to work in the casino industry and kind of hit the, or kind of their um, mindset going in was like, you know, I want to make something that, uh, you know, it's kind of just a one-time purchase sort of deal, but it has that fun and flash for people uh, to, you know, to get, uh, you know, get them to keep playing and to, you know, just enjoy themselves and have a good time. You know, and I, I, I can appreciate that kind of mindset because really like, I think on, I think on um, mobile, it's a free download, but you still got to buy the DLC, but you know, for five bucks on, for a console release, I mean, that's really not that bad of a deal for it because you get you get a lot of uh fun gameplay and just tons of content to go through yeah and people buy the dlc just to support the developer they're like Mm -hmm. you know this game is such a great value of course i'll buy two more dollars to get a new level and a bunch of new characters heck yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i love it too that with the dlc that it's not just like something where this like quickly slap together like what is it the dlc that gives you the um japanese inspired map I, I don't remember the name of it unfortunately but uh the moon um, glow yes moon glow thank you i think i think uh, twinkie on the last episode had to tell me what the name of it was too <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah moon glow is it's a fun it's a great map because it's just it's just absolutely huge it's a uh, unlike the other ones which kind of have the endless thing going it's more of a box like a big boxed in area but as you go to like the different zones of the map there's all these different enemies that can pop up uh there's different um power-ups you can find and like the first time you play it you can find a bunch of uh upgrade or um like you are sorry you, you'll find a bunch of like unlocks that you can get like a special kind of like like it's a samurai type of sword or a katana uh, there's other kind of. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. There's there's so many things to unlock and get in this game. It's just it's too much to list for one episode. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a lot of fun and it's real cheap. Uh, good good cheap fun. Agreed. Good cheap fun. Aren't we all looking for that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, my uh, honorable mentions I kind of mentioned before. I got totally hooked into Terry's Wonderland uh, 3DS, uh, the remake of the first Dragon Quest Monsters game back in November. And I kind of want to get back to it because um, I know the 3DS online play is shutting down in April. Although I have seen in the past week that they are starting to shut down some stuff a little at a time. So... I don't know if this online is shut down. I was uh, really excited. I think in the the 600th uh, weekly battle that they did recently, um, right, right at the end of November, because they have the weekly Wi-Fi battles, and I was in like the top 50 for both the regular and the special class. I went all out to try to get um, parties that would do that. So that's been fun playing that at the end of service there. And then, of course, as I talked with Pendy, um, Dragon Quest Monsters 3, the uh, Dark Prince has been awesome. So uh, honorable mentions to the Dragon Quest this game this year. Um, kind of surprisingly hooked on Atelier and the other two games were just amazing, amazing, amazing. Every time you say that damn name, it just sounds like you're saying Nutella. <laughs> Nutella. It just sounds like you're going to say Nutella instead Creamy, of Creamy, nutty today. goodness. It's just every time it goes with <laughs> goes with Harvestella. I got a theme this week this year. <laughs> that's that that's the um like harvest tomato blend. <laughs> there you go. Oh. <laughs> it's chunkier. Yes, that's the chunk. This is the chunky, chunky one. version. This is chunky. I eat that on my traveling with octopaths. So there you go. All our games of the year for you. So uh, that's it for this year-end episode of Slime Time SideQuest. Thanks to Pendy Paul and our dearly departed Matt Craft for joining us tonight to talk about their <laughs> personal best games of the year. Did, did Matt Craft die? <laughs> Let's remember him as he lived. <laughs> With wait, wait, Mr. Ert Infernix. We need to uh, end. The, we need to end the episode. We need to. Uh, for the ending of this episode, we need to play like a rendition of I will remember you. <laughs> <laughs> we, when you get like an, you get need to build like a, a bit crush version of that song, uh, Platty, and like put it at this moment right now. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Craft's going to listen to the episode and be like, what did they think I died for? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Is it the Sarah McLaughlin with the arms of the angel? Yep.
Um, yeah, no, the that, puppies. Yeah, 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 the with the puppies. puppies and the, yeah. yeah, there we go. I that think, too. yeah, we need that. Does she sing that song that where it goes like, I will remember you, you will remember me? Is that her? I think that's an old, I think that's older. But I think is that's that, Oh, yeah, that is, that is that Sarah that is, McLaughlin. Yeah, All right, yeah. Okay, sure. uh-huh. <laughs> wow, she, very typecast here with these uh, things to play for Matt Craft's Not Real Death. Right. <laughs> I, well, you know, for the longest time, I Happy thought time. she was the one that sang the song where it goes like, and I will always love you. Oh, God. I don't There's know the a name of that song, that is, that like, but it's the one with like, is that Celine playing, Dion? Like, I forget. It's her that sings that one, Celine Dion. I could be wrong. Oh, no, that's but... the Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton sings it. Whitney Houston sings it. Oh, Whitney Maybe Houston, that's it. Maybe it's yeah. Whitney, Whitney Houston, Houston from The Bodyguards. Of. Okay. There you go. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I totally thought that um, Sarah McLaughlin sang that song, too, because... It just seemed like it's the typecasting <laughs> song. Like for her, she <laughs> sings all these sad songs. <laughs> oh, oh, but yeah. All right. Um, yes, but <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us, and uh, both for this episode and for our previous guests that we had. Um, and I hope everybody that listened, uh, you know, heard of at least one game that uh, that we discussed tonight that they'd like to give a try or you know play it for themselves, or maybe they played the, one of the games that we talked about and are like. You know, those guys said a lot of the same things that I would have said, but they said it worse than I would have. <laughs> Almost certainly. Yes, uh, I'm sure there's something there. there. There's somewhere. There's something here for everybody to nitpick us. About. Oh, yes. Hey, if I'm not uh, you know, nitpicked, I'd be freaking surprised. <laughs> well, you know what I like to nitpick? Crowdsourcing <laughs> and okay. it dynamically inserted ads in podcasts. Nobody gives a shit about that. We're all grown-ass adults here. We like to talk about video games and other topics that we enjoy, and we don't need a dime of your money to do so. But if you'd like to contribute to DQ Fandom, feel free to head on over to the Dragon's Den, donate some money to Wootus, who's paid to keep those lights on for decades now, uh, use his affiliate links, buy Infinity Strash, buy Dragon Quest Monsters 3, or quite literally anything else on Amazon. I had a $2,000 order I had to do through school a year and a half ago. I made sure to click on his link and did it, and like he got $0.10. Cents. It was one wonderful all right Um, he was able to pay tax on his soda bottle so you know help out any way you can with the dragon's den Mm -hmm. but for a slime time we're good and you know all right well for you know what else is you know what else is good what is good the sponsor of tonight's episode wendy's you need yourself a good burger or a treat or something you go to wendy's and you get yourself that cheap dollar menu meal whatever they have because here at wendy's (laughs) we we love to Serve it up cheap style, baby. I don't know. What's, uh, what's their slogan? Uh, Wendy's, where we exist. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, this hey, is hey do they still have the uh, pretzel burgers? Um, you know what? For this advertisement, we sure do. You want a All pretzel right. burger? You come on down to, I was going to say Arby's, come down to Wendy's. Whatever restaurant we are, you come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Ask for that pretzel bun. We'll get it to you somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, give give money to Wootus. Help Wootus out. Please. He's a good man. All right. And for the last time in 2023, bye everyone. Side quest complete. See you all Catch in you later. 2024. This is Gutrude for Slime Time, reminding you all that you must complete your adventure. <laughs>